ladies and gentlemen a warm and delightful morning to all of you today the 4th of october holds a special place in the world of finance it marks the world financial planning day during the world investor week we are absolutely thrilled to welcome you on this auspicious day to our event financial planning and investment advisory the road ahead my name is kiran telang and i'm honored to be your mc for the day it will be my endeavor to guide you through a memorable and engaging program before we dive into our program let's take a moment to acknowledge the hard work and the dedication that has gone into making this event possible we'd like to extend our heartfelt thanks to our partners volunteers and all the individuals who have played a pivotal role in organizing this event without their support this would ha not have been possible i would like to thank our platinum partners dsp mutual fund hdfc mutual fund quantum mutual fund and sbi mutual fund our gold partners access mutual fund hsbc mutual fund snp dow jones indices white oak capital mutual fund our silver partners mirai asset mutual fund and tata mutual fund please ensure that your mobile phones are on silent mode or turned off to avoid any disruptions if you'd like to share your thoughts or highlights from the event on social media please use our event hashtag ARIAIAC Arya Investment Advisory Conference it is a privilege to have with us as our keynote speaker ms madhvi puri butch the distinguished chairperson of sebi please put your hands together to welcome madam <laughs> ms madhvi puri butch assumed the office of chairperson of securities and exchange board of india with effect from march 2 2022 ms butch has served as whole time director whole time member sebi till october 4 2021 she has handled market regulation department market intermediaries regulation and supervision department integrated surveillance department investment management department department of economic and policy analysis officer of investor assistance and education national institute of securities market and information technology department ms butch has held several senior positions across many financial institutions she has served as consultant to the new development bank in shanghai as the head of singapore office of the private equity firm greater pacific capital the managing director and chief executive officer at icici securities limited and as executive director on the board of icici bank ms butch also served as non executive director on boards of various companies she holds an mba from the indian institute of management ahmedabad and is a graduate in mathematics from st stephen's college new delhi welcome madam uh, may i request you to please grace the stage for lighting the ceremonial lamp i would also invite on stage for the lamp lighting mr vivek rege chairperson arya ms k kamla chief regulatory officer bsc india dr lata chari professor school of securities information and research nism ms aarti porwal country head of india at the cfa institute madam one photograph please. 
request Mr. Vivek Rege to stay back on stage for the next segment. He will be joined by Mr. Lowai Navlaki, Director Arya. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Mr. Vivek Rege, founder and CEO of VR Wealth Advisors Private Limited. With over 17 years of invaluable experience in the investment advisory industry, he is not just a SEBI registered investment advisor, but also holds an inter CA degree from the ICAI and a CFA level one from the CFA Institute, an advanced diploma in business management from ICFAI and a certified financial planner from FPSB India. Vivek's insights on personal finance have grazed esteemed publications and electronic media alike. Under Vivek's leadership, his firm has been awarded uh, the global winners for financial planning case studies in 2018 and 2019. Beyond running his practice, Vivek actively contributes to the financial community as a founder, board member, and current chair for ARIA, actively shaping its future. Please uh, give him a warm welcome. <laughs> now, let me introduce uh, Mr. Lovai, who will be subsequently joining uh, Vivek on stage. Uh, Mr. Lovai Navlaki, MD and CEO, International Money Matters Private Limited. As one of the first certified financial planners in India and the first certified financial transitionist from India, Lovai's commitment to understanding how individuals make decisions during life transitions sets him apart. He is a holder of an MBA finance from SPJN Institute of Management. Among the several awards he has won is the prestigious Global Financial Planner Award for the Asia region in 2018. Lovai's passion for cross-border financial planning issues and his ability to connect with professionals worldwide make him a true asset to the financial community. He is a firm believer that every individual deserves a trusted financial planner and he takes joy in connecting with like-minded professionals across the globe. Over to you, Vivek. Thank you. Thank you, Kiran. Thank you, Kiran. So, good morning, Madam Chair and all the esteemed guests. I'm delighted to extend a warm and a heartfelt welcome uh, to each and every one of you uh, as we gather for this special event. We have people uh, who are attending in this uh, hall as well as there are people who are virtually attending as well. Uh, we deeply uh, appreciate the presence and uh, thank you very much for being here and attending this event. As a chairperson of ARIA, I am privileged to address you today. Our association represents a community of financial professionals committed to the highest standards of integrity, ethics, and excellence in the field of investment advisory. I am honored to lead this community of dedicated professionals who share a common vision a common purpose, and in empowering the individuals and the families to secure their financial future. So together we strive for excellence, ethics, and trust in the world of investment advisory. Today's event is one such event, a milestone in the history of ARIA, where we are taking one such step to enhance the standards of practice. At the core is the well-being of the end investor for whom we all exist today. All of us will appreciate the fact that the investor protection, care, and the ethical conduct in the marketplace, what is expected, uh, ARIA has been on the forefront and through our the conduct and the conduct of our members as well, uh, we have been demonstrating and continue to demonstrate uh, this for the end, end investor. So thank you for your commitment uh, to our shared mission and I look forward to a future where the financial prosperity is within reach of all during this Amrit Kal and beyond. Thank you so much for a patient hearing and I take this event forward. Jai Hind to all of you. Uh, I would like to now request to play the ARIA video.
The investment advisory profession was formally recognized in 2013 in India when the investment advisory regulations were notified by SEBI. The investment advisory regulations cover three broad categories currently. From the financial planners engaged in comprehensive financial planning and asset allocation to the long-term single or multi-asset class investment advisory models who are forging bonds that transcend market trends to the trading call providers who are focused on short-term outcomes for investors. ARIA represents a tapestry of diverse professionals following distinct business models, each woven into the fabric of long-term relationships and trust. What truly sets us apart as investment advisors in India is our unwavering commitment to building enduring relationships with our clients. We are not mere transactional entities. We are advocates for financial well-being, companions in wealth management and architects of comprehensive financial plans. In 2017, the first national level RIA conference was held. At this event, a three-member task force consisting of Lovai Navlaki, Suresh Sadagopan and Vishal Dhawan was selected to provide leadership to our fledging profession. A year later, in 2018, the task force expanded to include Harsh Rungta, Rajendra Kalur and Vivek Rege, broadening our collective expertise and knowledge. Then, in 2019, Arya was born as a not-for-profit company under Section 8 with a clear objective to promote investor interests by elevating the standards of the investment advisory profession in India. In 2020, under the banner of Arya, we hosted our first conference. Over 150 RIAs attended this physical event, a testament to our growing community. Prominent figures like Mr. U.K. Sinha and Mr. Supratim Bandhupadhyay graced us with their presence. The same year, a nine-member ARIA board was elected, following the one-member, one-vote principle. ARIA formed various committees like advocacy, members' engagement, new membership, technology, media, finance, accounts and legal, VARIA, women for ARIA, and partners' engagement. In 2021, BSEASL became the official first-line regulator for RIAs. In 2021, ARIA initiated weekly knowledge-sharing sessions, attracting Indian and international speakers. We conducted hybrid workshops for deep learning on significant subjects by distinguished ARIA members. ARIA published and provided inputs for an in-depth white paper on reimagining nominations, making succession smoother and simpler. The white paper was written by Mr. Pramod Rao in his personal capacity. Mr. K. V. Kamath launched the white paper at a virtual event. The white paper offers insights into the challenges in succession planning and suggestions for reform. Mr. K. V. Kamath also launched the ARIA helpline on succession issues at the occasion. Throughout 2021 and 2022, ARIA organized major online events attended by over 1,500 delegates, including sessions for students exploring careers in financial planning and investment advisory. Mentorship programs for budding RIAs through RIA clinics were introduced to guide professionals into the RIA path. Mr. Mohan Das Pai conducted a session on ethics and ethical conduct through various examples which set the context on the required foundation on the growth of the investment advisory profession. In 2022, we released a research paper on international practices in risk profiling. Our Women for ARIA, Varya team conducted sessions for women investors and graduate students, promoting our profession as a viable career choice. In February 2023, we held our first flagship event, Aspire. 
featuring esteemed speakers like Mr. Anand Narayan, Mr. K. V. Kamath, and Mr. P. Gopichand. Mr. Anand Narayan requested Arya to share issues RIAs face with the current regulations and suggest how the profession could move forward on a stronger footing, for which we formed a working group in collaboration with the CFA Institute and CFA Society to address these issues and presented the findings to SEBI. At Aspire, the Women for Arya team launched a life continuation plan in partnership with Kotak Life Insurance Company, assisting families of life insurance claimants. As we tirelessly advocate for RIAs, Arya presented SEBI a detailed analysis of all enforcement orders passed against unregistered and registered investment advisors, showing that 95% of all enforcement orders were against trading call providers. Arya also presented a detailed analysis of complaints filed against registered investment advisors on the SCORES platform, showing that 9% of RIAs account for 94% of the complaints. Arya Chairperson Vivek Rege and Board Member Renu Maheshwari are appointed as members of the SEBI Intermediary Advisory Committee. Continuing our knowledge sharing session since 2021, Arya has held more than 100 sessions for members on diverse topics such as passive investments, RIA compliance, transforming client experience, practice management tools, fintech and ERP systems for RIAs, cyber security awareness. Arya has been upskilling its members and the RIA fraternity at large by conducting physical and hybrid workshops on key topics like NRI taxation, beyond client delight, RIA audit preparedness and mind mapping among others. 2023 also marks the year where Arya provided inputs to Syntonic for developing a risk profiling tool tailored for India. With a special emphasis on investor protection and enhancing investor trust to aid capital formation, SEBI has created global standards by setting the capital market environment. The settlement cycles in the stock markets are the lowest in the world and will soon be even lower, reducing risks and enhancing investor trust. The account aggregator framework will soon ease data flow to improve investor services. As ARIA, we have come a long way and we continue to evolve and innovate to promote investor interests by elevating the standards of the investment advisory profession. Thank you for being a part of our incredible and continuous journey. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to talk about a dream I had last night. Uh, of course, it was about financial planning, uh, which I sort of got into the profession in 2005. The dream was about 2nd October 2030, uh, World Financial Planning Day, seven years from today, uh, when Harsh was 70 years old and I wasn't. Uh, and. Uh, I saw that we had 1,20,704 RIAs. Uh, and there's, there is maths behind it. So we have 934 RIAs registered today. If you double that every year for the next seven years, you'll get that number. Uh, I think that's very important for us to recognize that RIAs as a profession uh, celebrate the word fiduciary in true sense and essence. Uh, I think the word fiduciary I heard for the first time when I attended a FPA conference uh, globally in the US. Uh, my partner in crime for many such conferences was Vishal, and then we had Vivek and Suresh and Harsh and many others who kept uh, giving us company. Um, and during those conferences, what we realized is that one thing we should not ever be afraid of is regulation. Uh, because primarily, I think the objective of both the regulator and us as fiduciaries 
is pretty much the same, that we have to protect investor interest, and we have to have more investors whose interests we can protect. And that, I think, really is the common objective that ARIA shares uh, with the regulator. I think the other important thing we recognized is that transparency is really the key. Uh, you have to be extremely transparent about the type of service you're offering uh, and you know what you're charging, what, where you're earning. And as long as you do that, I think you're going to be more than fair to your investor. So the question really is, how are we going to get there from this 934 to that 1 lakh 20 number? You know, lots and lots of suggestions, and really it's not my uh, duty here to talk about it for over length of time. But I think there are a few quick things that we possibly need to think of. Uh, number one, we need, probably need to think of investors, intermediaries, and products as two tier, at least, maybe three tier. But think of investors who are uh, aware and investors who are not aware. You think of uh, products which are simple and products which are complex. You look at intermediaries who are regulated and those who are not. And if you can match these together, I think you will have a big growth in the industry. I think the other thing that I personally think is that when the RI regulations came in, there was the exemption for incidental advice given to mutual fund distributors, to brokers, to insurance agents. Uh, possibly it's time to think of removing uh, this uh, incidental advice if you are taking uh, exemption in more than one category. So if you're doing multiple things, then you bring them into the gambit of uh, an intermediary. Uh, the one thing that we, I personally think that I'm very you know, keen to understand is how behavior of investors happens when they are advised versus when they are not. Unfortunately, no data is available. Uh, today, when we tell our investors that we are going to, in, you know, put you in a direct plan, they said, oh, so we have to do it all by ourselves. Possibly it's time to think of a nomenclature called advice plan so that we can have data on that as well. Of course, we need simpler regulation for simpler products. Uh, maybe, if, you know, financial planning day, it's possibly time to think of financial planners who don't do execution, not having limits to the number of plan, you know, plans that they can make. Uh, and I think most importantly, I think each one of us needs to remember that we are, and I repeat uh, something that I've mentioned at Aspire uh, 2023 as well, that we are all part of a movement. Uh, so we are setting the path, and we need to be able to ensure that we will face difficulties, but we are looking ahead to 2030 when we have one like 20,000 plus uh, RIS. Time to wake up from, from the dream and let's get to reality. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek and Lowai, for taking us through Arya's journey so far. And thanks to Lowai for sharing the wonderful dream. I hope it comes true. I would like to now invite on stage Mr. Vishal Dhawan and Mr. Prasad Ramani for an introduction of Arya's Syntonic project. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Vishal Dhawan, co-founder of Plan Ahead Wealth Advisors Private Limited. With an educational background in economics and an MBA in finance, Vishal has over 25 years of industry experience. He has held various positions at the Financial Planning Association, particularly in cross-border financial planning. Vishal was also the recipient of Ken Gillespie Legacy Fund Scholarship by Money Quotient, one of the leading life planning coaching firms globally in 2013. Under Vishal's leadership, his firm Plan Ahead received consecutive Best Investment Advisor Awards from 2016 to 2019 in the Outlook Money Awards and has secured the second runner-up position in the Plan Plus Global Awards Asia region for 2017 and 2018. Vishal is also the founder director of ARIA, uh, the Association of Registered Investment Advisors. Uh, Mr. Prasad Ramani is the founder and chief product officer of Syntonic. He's passionate about empowering people to make better financial decisions using behavioral finance and technology. From serving as head of quant for a global family office, co-managing dollar 1.4 billion to building automated quantitative risk platforms and forecasting models for asset management firms, Prasad has more than 20 years of experience in behavioral and quantitative finance, 
with a deep understanding of the interplay between behavioral psychology, risk, and investing. He's also a regular guest speaker at the London Business School, where he has been teaching behavioral finance and decision science as a part of the Strategic Investment Management Executive Program since 2017. Over to you, Vishal. Thank you, Kiran. So it's an absolute delight to be awake after that lovely dream that Lovai uh, put us through. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to sort of see this journey culminate. This journey actually started about 11 months ago uh, when we actually reached out to the SEBI chairperson to join us for the Aspire Summit 2023. And during the course of all of those conversations, there was a suggestion that came up that maybe we need to look at something which can actually help the investment advisory profession as well as a regulator in finding uh, things that happen where risk profiling could actually be possibly manipulated. And uh, it seemed like a tall ask, but like always, you know, we've been used to tall asks. Luckily, a lot of people on the board are also very tall. Uh, so what we did is uh, we went back to the ARIA board as we normally do. Uh, we spent time looking at, you know, who are the alternatives who could actually help develop a technology tool that can actually help with risk profiling. And uh, basis all the inputs, uh, we shortlisted Syntonic with their rich experience in behavioral science and their expertise, because they have so many PhDs sitting in their, in their room that I think uh, you know, lots of times uh, we don't even understand what they say. Uh, the starting point for all of this was actually to go back and look at what was really happening on risk profiling. So at ARIA, we went back and looked at all the enforcement orders passed by SEBI, specifically on the risk profiling element. And we had a leading law firm actually do that for us so that we are not missing anything which is really important as we get to developing this tool. There were some very um, interesting things that came out from that understanding of the enforcement orders. And I'd probably take a full day running through all of that, but I'm just going to talk about some key findings that came across in that uh, element. One was there was risk profiling happening prior to collecting of fees, which clearly is not allowed as per regulation. The second thing we found was that the information that was getting collected was not as prescribed under the regulation, and therefore not all and a 360-degree view was being taken before giving investment advice. The third thing we found is that even though an investor may have completed a risk profile, there was no communication going back to investors saying that their risk profile has got completed. Fourthly, we found that there was a little bit of lack of client interaction during that whole process as well. And clearly, risk assessment is not only about the numbers, but there's also a lot which comes out from good and rich conversations that happen around risk profiling. Of course, uh, because Syntonic was based in North America, there was a need to customize the tool very clearly to Indian conditions. Uh, so we had to spend time getting questions Indianized, look at client reputability, look at um, you know, how red flag consent, uh, red flag alerts consent, et cetera, can all get built in. And obviously, this tool then needed to be tested in India as well, which is what we've been doing over the last few weeks. Uh, last but not the least, it also needed to comply with Regulation 16 of the Investment Advisor Regulation, which really sets the standards of what risk profiling is about. And I'd urge anyone who's not read that regulation to go through that to see how carefully and well it has been drafted to ensure that a full persona of the investor is actually looked at before a risk profiling uh, assessment is actually completed. Now, this is where, obviously, the genesis of what Prasad will talk to you about in a bit um, uh, is going to start from. So over to you, Prasad. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you here today. And uh, thank you for the lovely introduction, Vishal. It is often said that uh, you know, one is judged by the company one keeps. Uh, if that's the case, I like to be judged today. Uh, the company cannot get any better. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam Chairperson, uh, Kamala Madam, and the others for your august presence here and honoring us with your presence here today. I really appreciate it. When, when Arya came to us right, with this particular project, 
The one thing that was very evident was we have a shared goal, we have a shared purpose. Our goal at Syntonic is to actually help the end investor make the best decisions that they can to secure their long-term financial future. And when Aria came to us with this particular project, uh, it was kind of like a love at first sight. So we knew that this was going to work. Of course, as with any romance, it went through a bit of a you know, rocky patch with all the development sessions and discussions and everything. But I cannot overstate the, the amount of impact and influence Aria has had in the development of this particular tool. Um, they spent a lot of time with us. They took us through all the key features that were needed for specifically the Indian markets. And I think we can be reasonably proud of what we have come out with, uh, which we truly feel will help the financial advisor fulfill their fiduciary responsibilities in a more tangible purpose, in a more tangible way. I could go on and talk about this particular tool, but the ARIA board very strongly felt that the video would make a better you know, presence than me doing that here. So let the video do the talking. Uh, thank you very much for all, for, for all of you being here. It's, it's such a great day to be here, and, and thank you very much once again. Thank you. Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. On average, the human brain makes thousands of decisions a day. For example, when it comes to food alone, we can make upwards of 400 plus decisions a day. Imagine we start the day with the intention of eating healthy and at 4 p.m. we are given a choice between a healthy salad or a piping hot samosa. What would we do? we would most likely end up with the summers. This is because our brains are hardwired to take shortcuts. And we often take such shortcuts. Without our own awareness, we can end up creating a gap between our intentions and outcomes. This happens with our financial decisions as well. At Syntonic, we have identified key non-conscious factors that influence our financial decision-making process, thus creating a gap between our intentions and outcomes. These factors can produce three key gaps. The investor self gap, the advisor investor gap, the compliance gap. Let's take investor self gap. The investor self gap arises because oftentimes investors act in ways that go against their own long-term interests. For instance, they are ready to spend hours watching a movie but will be reluctant to spend 15 minutes discussing important financial topics which can impact the next 15 years of their lives. When markets go up, they tend to be aggressive but when markets go down, they turn conservative. Finally, most investors and their spouses approach money or finances from different perspectives, which can lead to differences in household finances causing a great deal of stress and hence poor decisions. Next we have the advisor-investor gap. We all approach money and finances differently, which results in different takes on investing as well. For most advisors, risk is a well-defined quantitative value like volatility and drawdown. However, for most investors, risk is very qualitative. Hence, there is a misalignment of what risk means for advisors and their investors. Advisors assume that risk is a static number, but the reality is that risk is dynamic. It changes based on external and internal factors. Most advisors tend to approach risk through the prism of markets and returns, that is, from a single dimension, whereas true risk is multidimensional. The compliance gap. Last but not the least is the compliance gap. Generally speaking, when markets are doing well, there are not many issues between advisors and investors. However, once markets start going sideways, a variety of issues start to come up and in most cases, there is not one single source of truth. These gaps arise for three reasons. First, a thorough and scientific analysis of the investor's risk profile is missing. Second, there is no mechanism to share risk analysis automatically and promptly with investors. And third, proper digital records of investor consent are not available or are often missing. To address these issues, Syntonic and Aria work together to create the RiskQ solution. 
Risk Q is the first of its kind solution that is custom built for India with features such as behavioral based risk profiling, dynamic risk range, pair analysis for investors, and client consent and non repudiability. Risk Q approaches risk profiling through four dimensions. Risk drivers helps understand the behavioral factors that drive one's financial decision making and risk appetite. Risk preference reveals how one views risk and the emotional ability to handle losses. Risk capacity ascertains the financial ability to take risk. Risk need addresses the purpose behind taking risk. This results in a win-win-win situation for everyone involved. The investor, advisor, and the regulator. Advantage Investor Risk Q takes an investor-centric approach by placing them at the heart of the financial discovery and planning process. It enables them to understand how they think behaviorally when they make financial decisions. It takes investor psychology into consideration and helps them understand the dynamic nature of their risk appetite. It helps build mutual understanding between investors and their spouse or partners through a behavioral lens, thus enabling them to communicate and work together as a single team. Advantage Advisor Risk Q promotes richer conversations between advisors and investors around risk and investing, enabling them to showcase the value addition they bring to the table. It shortens the trust cycle because it improves transparency and brings about a personalized approach, truly placing the advisor on the same page with investors. It safeguards advisor interests as it helps set investor expectations around reward and risk and also records investor consent digitally. Advantage Compliance Risk Q helps the compliance function ensure that all risk standards are met accurately through using a scientifically rigorous process. As it records key advisor investor risk analysis digitally, a footprint is always available to detect anomalies, hence allowing for an audit trail. It protects investor interests and promotes taking a more disciplined approach to investing. The Risk Q tool from Syntonic, enhanced by inputs provided by ARIA, is born from the synergy between ARIA and Syntonic. It represents a profound commitment to investor interests that is specifically tailored for Indian financial advisors and their clients. This is our shared journey with you all toward a more informed, transparent and secure financial advisory landscape. Thank you, Vishal and Prasad, for sharing your insights earlier. I would now request uh, SEBI Chairperson, Madam Butch, to please come on stage for the official inauguration of the Risk Q tool by Syntonic. I would request uh, Vive uh, Prasad and Vishal to please accompany her. Thank you, Madam. Uh, may I now request you to uh, Ma'am, may I now request you to please address the audience? Very good morning to each one of you. It's uh, wonderful to be here, and uh, it's wonderful to see um, that an idea and a dream that I had a year ago to say that let us use technology to benefit everybody and to create a win-win situation all round rather than a win-lose situation all round has today 
taken shape. So I'm extremely pleased. And thank you so much for making this happen, Arya. Before I start my presentation, um, I would like to uh, respond to Mr. Lovai's uh, dream um, by narrating a little story. Uh, so this was many years ago. I think it goes back almost 23, 25 years ago. Um, ICSA Direct, the online share um, trading platform, had not yet been born. And uh, McKinsey had made a report for ICICI Group uh, about the opportunities of the digital world and uh, the digital financial markets and how this was an opportunity um, for really the ICICI Group to do something which was path-breaking. And uh, they prepared a report. And um, uh, Mr. Kamath uh, called me one day into his room. And he handed me the report. And uh, he said, go build this. So I said, delighted to. And I left. Next morning, I was back in his room. I gave him back the report. Sir, I don't want to do this. He said, why? I said, sir, where is the ambition in this? They're talking about 25,000 clients at the end of three years. I have better things to do with my life than to try and chase 25,000 clients in three years. If the target is one lakh clients in the first year, then I'm happy to do it. <laughs> of course, Mr. Kamath, being Mr. Kamath knew that there had to be some catch to what I was saying. He said, what do you want? I said, sir, my system banaungi to ek lakh ke liye banaungi, so I need 10 crores. At that time, 10 crores was a lot of money. So for the system development, I asked for 10 crores, saying, what is this, 25,000? Not worth. So to tell you what happened at the end of that one year, no, we did not reach 1 lakh, but we reached 88,000 at the end of the first year. And while he gave me 10 crores, I think we used about 5 or 6 crores to build the system at that time. And of course, you know, today, online share trading is just everything. So I not only share your dream, see, kya saal time hota hai, lakh ki baat karte hai. The question is, how do we get there? And how do we get there with the right 10 lakh, right? Where do we get that one million advisors from? And I think that what I'm going to share with you is just the start. Um, I believe uh, Harsh has a number of very aggressive questions lined up for me. So uh, I will not uh, preempt those questions. Um, but I would like to share with you um, not only our thoughts on the investment advisory domain, but also on how we think about industry associations. This is really, really important, right? So because SEBI works in a very dynamic environment, and I keep saying that, you know, we try and be stable in a market which is roaring behind us. So there's, it's, never, it's never stable. We don't operate in a stable environment. The market is constantly, you know, in upheaval. Sometimes it's stormy. Sometimes it's a little bit calmer. But it is never static. And our job is to try and bring some amount of groundedness and stability to what is otherwise an extremely uh, dynamic and stormy uh, environment. For us, the association of market participants is extremely important. Um, we have learned this over the years, and we have often articulated that SEBI has two really, really um, a strong, um, strong tools. One is our advisory committees, where the best and brightest minds of the country, of the market's domain, come and give us their time, and give us their perspective, and help us to co-create the regulations that we finally notify. 
The second is the industry associations who work very closely with us to actually take the regulation to the ground. Because a piece of paper can never be the regulation on the ground. That regulation has to come alive, and that is what the associations do. So um, whenever we have uh, an opportunity, we encourage people to form associations and to actually um, create a lot of, um, shall I say, strength in that organization. Because a strong association really means that it will have the respect of the regulator and therefore the advocacy function, which is so important to it, uh, will be just more effective, right? The one thing that we do ask in the context of advocacy is that the association should ensure that at its board and in all its working functions, it is well representative of all the different segments of the profession. So whether it is large or big, individual or institutional, uh, people who give trading calls or those who do financial planning, there must be a good representation because that is what lends weight. When you sit at a table across from us and give us your views, we know it is coming from the strength of representation. The second thing that we always request our associations is please come to us with data. And I think that again, Arya has um, you know, just taken this thought to the next level. The two reports that were talked about um, were really, really meaningful. Uh, of course, um, I must admit that in my previous aftar in SEBI, um, I must have passed about 80% of all of those orders. So you can imagine how pained I am. Um, you know, I have personally gone through and, and seen you know, people being driven to suicide uh, because of what the, the bad things that happen in the market. But at the end of the day, not only for the regulator to see the data, but for the world at large to see the data, this is really, really important. So whether it is an analysis of the enforcement orders or an analysis of scores complaints, I think that coming at it with data is the most effective thing that you can do uh, in engaging uh, with SEBI. As I said earlier, that we consider our advisory committees as very crucial uh, in helping us to co-create regulation, right? Now, in that co-creation, what we have learned is two things over time. And again, I think Arya has completely understood us and has responded you know, extremely constructively. Is that today when we say that technology is available for the investors, when technology is available for investment advisors, technology is also available to us. So we have the ability to do supervision and to do uh, compliance monitoring at a segmented level. So we do not need to live in Baba Adam Ka Zamana where one size fits all and you sort of want to make everybody follow the same rules. That should not be the case, right? If there, is, if there are distinct segments in the market, then they must be regulated differently. And therefore, we are completely open and willing to look at a segmented approach to regulation. The only caveat we have is that on account of having, you know, um, on account of the fact that we sit where we sit, uh, we end up standing where we stand. Because what we find is that um, a person will say, I do not give trading calls. His wife does. Okay. Now, within SEBI, we call this Shana Panti. Okay. So when we have to draft regulations, we also have to worry about shana panti. So hathi ke daan dikhane ke aur hote hain aur khane ke aur hote hain. And so what seems to a person from the outside saying now, okay, Sebi is saying they're happy to do segmented approach. Uh, so why don't we just divide this all up? And then we start to say, okay. So tell us how we will get a confirmation that the person who is saying, I do not give trading calls, does not have 
uh, a relative or an associate or anybody else who's actually you know, doing that and from where you know, there is a second source of income coming. So in this process of co-creation, people who actually sit in our committees and who get involved, I think rapidly understand that it's not as simple as it looks on the outside to do something because there are structural vulnerabilities. Uh, when you do something which is, uh, you know, flexible, uh, there, is, there are enough and more people who are there to try and do shanapanti about it. So we need to, in this process of co-creation, think carefully about that and to build, uh, not, not that we don't do it, but we have to build adequate risk mitigation measures uh, to make sure that that doesn't happen. One of the recent initiatives that SEBI has taken is uh, we've gone to the next step. So we've talked about how uh, we you know, do a lot of consultation and the advisory committees work with us to co-create the regulation. But being a hardcore ops person myself for many decades, uh, I believe the devil is always in the detail. You know, nobody disagrees with you conceptually or in principle. The problem comes in implementation. So how is the industry supposed to actually implement something is the problem. And that is where a bigger problem is that the good guys will end up over-engineering the compliance and the bad guys will really not care at all. And then you end up creating a non-level playing field and then the good guys are watching and seeing the, the bad guys take the market share and say, look, they're just getting away with this, but our governance will not allow us to do the bad stuff. So which is why it's really important that there be industry standards. Now, in this process, what SEBI has learned, not just in respect of investment advisors, but across the board for all our regulations, what we have learned is that the reality is that we are not in the market. We are not doing what you do on the ground level day after day. And therefore, the setting of standards is perhaps done in consultation, or rather is perhaps best done by the industry itself, but it needs to be done in consultation with SEBI for two reasons. Number one is that if there is some area which is really, um, you know, what I would call the marginal utility of compliance is low, but the cost is very high, it is possible that the industry may come back to us and say, look, do you really need this? Because this is so difficult for us to implement at the ground level. Is this really burningly important to you? Now, 80% of the things may be burningly important. And we may say, you know, and we will be able to, of course, go chapter and verse and all the shanapanti that happens around it and so many orders that we have passed and say, sorry, we really do need it. But there could be occasions where it is possible to be more flexible. So which is why that consultation process is important. Equally, if the industry sets a standard which is going in the opposite direction to the regulation, right? Regulation says go north and the standards are designed in a way to actually actively go south, uh, then SEBI cannot endorse such a standard. So which is why that process of consultation is important. So over the last few months, we have uh, set up numerous, uh, on a pilot basis, numerous uh, fora to look at implementation of industry standards. And that is something which we are keen as a, as a strategy and as a part of our regulatory architecture itself, we are keen to take that forward. And so the role of the association will become more and more and more over time. And therefore, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what the economics of this of ARIA are, but I can only assure all the members that any contribution and membership fee that they ask of you uh, is probably a, a good investment on your part. Um, I would like to talk about, um, you know, um, certain issues which, um, which concern us as a regulator and where we would like to seek help from the association because what we have found is that the mutual respect and um, uh, acceptance of the regulator and the association comes when each of them empathizes with each other's problems, right? So here's something as simple as we required 
investment advisors to register with the new first level regulator. There are a large number, some 35% of investment advisors have still not registered. अब हम करें तो क्या करें मतलब इतना टाइम दिया आसान सा प्रोसेस है आप आए रजिस्टर करें उसमें क्या दिक्कत हो रही है इफ़ इट्स योर प्रोफेशन इफ इट इज़ योर लाइवलीहुड एंड इन ऑल दिस टाइम फॉरगेट अबाउट अदर कंप्लाइंस यू हैव नॉट फाउंड द टाइम और द इंक्लिनेशन टू कम एंड रजिस्टर विद द फर्स्ट लेवल रेगुलेटर अब हम क्या कहें क्या कहें सो वी लुक टू द इंडस्ट्री टू असिस्ट अस यू नो यू आर देयर ऑल ओवर द कंट्री ओके यू हैव प्रेजेंस यू हैव पीपल यू हैव पीपल हु केयर अबाउट द कम्युनिटी हु स्पेंड देयर टाइम एंड एफर्ट एंड एनर्जी यू नो इन एक्चुअली वर्किंग फॉर द कम्युनिटी We really need your assistance, starting from something as simple as bhaiya, aake register karo, right? And therefore, that's just you know not even one o one. I don't know. That's the foundation. But beyond that, the other thing we look towards to the uh, to the association is to be proactive in terms of. coming to us with the malpractices in the market see everybody understands that the regulator should be in touch with the market right we should not be making regulations sitting in some ivory tower so how are we to be in touch with the market how do we know what is going on in the market the only way to know is if the association and its responsible members come and tell us and sometimes let me tell you this is done in a very uh, interesting way people have walked into my room even before they sit down and i can ask them whether they would like tea or coffee madam aapko malum nahi aapke naak ke niche kya chal raha hai okay so and i welcome that i love it even before we've sat down and had tea because he is so agitated because he is one of the good guys and he's so agitated ki sabhi ke naak ke niche kya chal raha hai aapko dikh nahi raha aap kuch kar nahi rahe hain and that is what we need we need the good guys to come to talk to us to tell us what are the mal practices in the market and to help us to craft solutions so that we address that so that the good guys win we don't want we want a million investment advisors let me tell you it's as much i would say not as much i think it is clearly our failure that we have such a small set of investment advisors okay and every new whole time member who comes into sebi some of my colleagues here will vouch for it every new member who comes in takes a look at it and says why is this number so small why isn't it larger and two weeks later after they go through all the details they are like we can't have 1 lakh of these kind of guys right so that's the problem okay we can't have 10 lakhs of these kind of guys but we definitely need 10 lakh of those kind of guys we need the good guys to win and for that the association has to come forward and a tell us what's happening because by the time we otherwise get to know a couple of people have already committed suicide in indore that's the reality the second area is and this is something which i must share with you that you know i've been where you are right somebody read out my resume right i've been a broker i've been an investment advisor i've been all of those things when people make claims what is fact and what is fake now investment advisors have come and told us look you're saying don't make a claim how am i supposed to sell anything to my client right even a, a cream says you will be fairer in 3 weeks if you use my cream they're making a claim you're not allowing me to make a claim how am i supposed to sell my service to anybody now we took that feedback on board saying sahi baat hai right because whatever you don't allow above the table will go under the table 
Whatever you don't allow in the, in the, in the sunlight will go into the darkness, right? So therefore, you would have seen our consultation paper on performance validation agencies. Now, this is a completely radical concept to say that there will be an institutional mechanism. You come there, you validate your claims, and then you can make that claim. Now, what is the modality? How is it to be done naturally? A lot of thinking will have to go into it. But what I'm saying is, when there is a genuine need in the market, it is our objective to address that need because we want to get to that one million. But we have to be very careful about fact versus fake, and we all know, right? I don't need to tell you, you know, algo players will claim 300% return per annum. Use my algo. I mean, you really think SEBI is so dumb? No, first of all, on the face of it. And secondly, we, when we ask them, so, you know, what is the basis of this? They've done a retrofit of the data. And on the basis of that, they say 300% return per annum. I mean, what do you say, Dhirendra? I mean, we have so much understanding of Matlab, your modeling data and your test data has to be different. No, if you retrofit on the same data, of course you will get 300% return. You pick up stocks which have delivered 300% return and you, you plot an algo for those, of course you will get it, na? Of course you will get it. Ye to aap hindsight ke, mera ghoda hamesha jeetta hai. Of course, kyunki aapne you tested it against the ghoda who has already jeetod in the last 15 races. Usme kaun si badi baat hai? Koi bhi bana dega aapko. Why 300%? 500% return bana dega. Ab humko bevkuf samaj ke rakha hai. So the question is, ki how do we deal with this? Because at the end of the day, unfortunately, you know, as was being said in that wonderful presentation on risk profiling, the investors often work against their own interest. And these get-rich-quick schemes, and you know, you can make, I mean, all of those uh, Finfluencer videos, it's amazing, you know, the, 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 the thumbtacks of those videos are all about how my student has made, you know, 15 crores in the last one year, and how my, yesterday my, my student made, you know, five lakhs, and you know, yesterday this happened, and yesterday that happened. Fact versus fake. Okay. Y'all are all seasoned investment advisors. Any of the claims that you see on social media today, do you believe a single one of them? Anyone. And my test is simple. When people say, how do you test? I'm saying, I have a very simple test. You know, these platforms very often say, we are only a platform. We don't know what our people, you know, our community says on it. We don't know. We are just a platform. I ask them, will you recommend your platform to your mother-in-law? Will you tell your mother-in-law, you know, Maji, you can go to my platform. There are 50 really good guys there. Pick any of them and you will be in good financial state. Will you recommend to her? Obviously not. A Maji kha jayenge unko. Right? Because the first time she makes an investment, she will lose it all. So the question is, this fact versus fake is a crucial thing, not just for the regulator. It's crucial for the investor. And this segregating the wheat from the shaft, the fact from the fake, we need your help. That is the reality. Because you know what's going on, and you have the best idea of how we can address this issue. Investment advisor registrations for rent. Aajkal khub secondary market chal raha hai suna. So, matlab, pehle hum log bolte thi ki hamari stock market mein, you don't just trade shares, you know, you trade profit and loss, long term capital gains, there are lots of things you trade. Okay? Aajkal secondary trade in registrations is happening. What, you know, again, we are flummoxed. I have no other word to tell you. We are flummoxed. So we look to you. Tell us what to do. Because you are the good guys. And those guys are the bad guys. So help us to address this issue. How do we do it? Circumvention of the law. Large number of complaints that we get. Oh, I gave my user ID and password 
to my advisor. Oh, he's supposed to ask me before trading. No, no, he just took my credentials and then, so this is all illegal PMS going on. Okay. Then, of course, there are those who, you know, have found ways to exceed the 150 number. They, they become authorized persons of brokers. They have terminals. Then they user ID password. They are also running themselves. Right? Correct, right? We have, see, unfortunately, we are the doctor. We see all the ill patients. And this is not an isolated case. There, we have now seen dozens and dozens of these cases of illegal PMS being carried out. And to be honest, sometimes when I think about it, you know, I, I really think that we've not understood, you know, what is really going on in the market. Because at the end of the day, what does the investor pay for? Right? So somebody says, why are you not permitting a profit sharing model for investment advisory? I'm saying this is, I don't understand the question. Advice means you give somebody advice, it's his prerogative to take it or not take it. That's what advice means. What you are then saying to us is, no. I say I'm giving advice, actually I'm just managing his portfolio, I'm executing everything, and now since I'm delivering profit to him, I should have a share of that profit. Okay, that's called PMS. That's not called advisory. So, and again, you know, like I said, somebody come, came into my room and was agitated about aapke niche hai, naak ke niche kya ho Equally, a very respected person from this community came to my room and said, Madhvi, you've been there. Don't you know? Investors never pay for advice. They only pay for performance. I'm saying, yeah, that's true. That's my experience as well. So, so what are you saying? Are you running a PMS? I asked him. He said, yes. See, in that room, he could say that, and I heard it. And the logic was, customers do not pay for advice, they pay for performance. What do you want me to do? You're running a PMS. Yeah, I'm running a PMS. So, Abhi, kya bole? How many people took investment advisor registration and ran uh, essentially um, mutual fund distribution with, I'm sorry, Navneet, with advertising revenues, which was nothing but commission? Right? The advertising revenue of that platform matches perfectly with the number of transactions that he facilitated, so-called direct transactions. Wonderful. Month to month, makhi to makhi, the ad revenue will be based on how much business went there. Kehneko, it is a direct platform. How? By passing my investment advisor code. So circumvention of the law I can only say help us. I can only say help us because we want to get to one million, but we cannot have the wrong one million. Imagine if you had one million of those indoor type, and I'm not afraid to say indoor type because it's there in the orders. This is public. If you had done a geographic distribution, which I think you had, it was very clear, right? So can we afford to have one lakh of the indoor type investment advisors? No, we cannot, right? As a regulator, we cannot. So help us here. We really need this. The positive side, of course, of the whole association is that, and this is becoming increasingly common and we are delighted to see it, that for the use of technology, it's very expensive for each member to go out there and negotiate a system, let's say, for instance, a risk profiling system, and it's also uh, very difficult, you know, it, it was not easy to do, uh, you know, the Indianization and setting the context and the configuration for our regulations. It's not easy. Each person cannot do it. But when the industry association does it, and I know that it must have taken a lot of time, effort, uh, energy, 
and, um, and high decibel level discussions to get this done. But it's been done, and now the entire community can benefit from it through this group buying, which is not just about getting a good price for the product, but also having a ready-made plug-and-play product, which you can just plug in, and literally in 50, 60 rupees a pop, you can do risk profiling. I mean, what can be better than that? Also, I think, um, you know, how that system then evolves, because the market evolves, the regulation evolves, and how to constantly keep it flexible and adaptable. Again, the association plays a very crucial role in this. And so we are delighted that Arya has taken this up. Um, and in summary, I would therefore say that standing here today, I'm, I'm really delighted with, with what I see in terms of the progress that Arya has made. Uh, but you can be bigger, stronger, uh, and much more representative of and, and playing a much more active role with the regulator to co-create regulation, to, to, to implement in, uh, industry standards for implementation, and for helping the good guys to win. And with that, uh, we raise uh, all our glasses. I can't say a toast, but all our glasses to 10 lakh investors, investment advisors. Thank you, Madam, for that very enlightening and encouraging uh, speech. Uh, I will have to request you to come back on stage, ma'am, for the Q&A session uh, with Mr. Harsh Rungta. I'd like to welcome Mr. Harsh Rungta. Harsh is the Principal Officer of Fee Only Investment Advisors, LLP. He is a distinguished chartered accountant and a tax expert. Harsh has been a serial entrepreneur, having successfully exited his venture-funded startups, apnaloan.com and apnapaisa.com. In 1998, he was responsible for setting up ICICI's retail lending business. He is also the author of the Complete Home Loan Guide. He is a well-known expert on finance on popular business channels and writes a fortnightly column, Truth Be Told, in the Business Standard. And he has been conducting several workshops on taxation and personal finance. Over to you, Harsh. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, you know, it almost uh, reminded me of the ICICI days, you know, the one lakh target. Uh, I think, uh, and, and I think uh, it has been achieved in so many other areas. I mean, if, if just looking at, uh, you know, Amrit Kal, as they say, is upon us, and if you look at the role that SEBI has played, you know, it's a seminal role, right? I mean, global standard setting, uh, capital market infrastructure. I mean, we're talking of T plus one has been done and we are now talking uh, one hour and instant uh, uh, settlements. The mutual fund industries, I mean, all the leading lights are here, half a trillion dollars and, and counting two billion dollars uh, of SIPs and uh, Mahesh is here, account aggregator. I mean, it will democratize uh, the availability of uh, citizen data. And yet when we turn to the investment advisory profession, uh, and you know, clearly, as you yourself mentioned, you know, less than a thousand uh, people today, and God willing, we will be the one lakh plus, uh, one million plus, I'm sorry. Uh, one million. I, I, I missed a zero. <laughs> I missed a zero. Uh, and, and obviously what happens because of that is that the unregistered investment advisors, UIAs, I, as I like to call them, or Finfluencers, they sort of have rushed in. Because there is a need, clearly, a fiduciary need for fulfilling that advice. Okay? And that's how we came up with this analysis and Thank you very much for the kind words uh, on that. So very clearly, I think from the association side, 
there are just two things, you know, and this is something we have heard that uh, is the regulator, okay, worried about the low number of RIAs? Is it in investor interest that it will be so low? Uh, because otherwise, if the fiduciary registered advisors are not there, the UIAs are obviously uh, coming in. And you, sp you spoke about the segmented regulation and the difficulties uh, with that. So the issue, I, I mean, I, 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 I'm just going to turn that into a question, but the issue with that is that today probably, as we mentioned in the ARIA video, there are three segments. And it's very difficult for, say, a financial planner or a non-trading call provider to be able to identify all the malpractices that happen in a trading call provider. So would the regulator sort of look at segmenting out or in, depending on whichever way it goes? Because maybe these three segments don't belong together. Uh, and it's an accident of history that, you know, they've sort of got into a common regulation. Uh, because uh, the ability of the association to be able to represent three completely distinct kinds, and definitely the trading call providers, which are the cause of the problem, 95% of the orders, you know, un and unregistered being 72%, how do we sort of even begin uh, working uh, with the regulator on that? So I'll tell you, Harsh, I, you know, we are completely open and, um, you know, I think you've rightly said that if something is an accident of history, we shouldn't just perpetuate it for the sake of perpetuation. And I think the uh, recent uh, extension of the academic requirement uh, circular that we did is a, is a reflection of that. Because what the team believed was, three years ago, what was said, Today, the world is completely different. You don't even need to go into ancient history. Just three years ago, the world, in terms of the way that there were uh, influencers, unregistered advisors, uh, chatbots, and chat GPT, tomorrow, algo players, the world has changed entirely in three years. And therefore, for us to stick with what we said three years ago is perhaps not appropriate, and it needs review, and let us give an extension, and let us review. So I think the evidence is on the table that SEBI is not wedded to anything which is Baba Adam. If life has changed, we will change. So that commitment is there and is in evidence. I think, as I said earlier, our problem is So if you say, just separate us from the guys who give the trading calls, I have only one question to ask. Please tell me what is the source of your income. Okay. Because I hear again and again, I narrated that story, investors do not pay for advice, they pay for performance. Then other sources of revenue. What other sources? Now I will give a referral to the broker. Now for all the trading that the broker does, that he does through that broker, I will get a certain cut. Okay. Why? Because, no, that I'm an authorized person. So, you know, I'm entitled to get. So, I'm saying, at the end of the day, I have not met a single person, a single person, who has come to me and said, my client pays me for the advice I give him, nothing more. Uh, so, yeah, I've I'm, not met. I'm sorry to interrupt uh, there, but... Uh, as, as it was introduced, the name of my firm itself is called Harsh. Fee Only Investment Harsh, Advisor. I'll tell you. Let me give you another example. Yeah. I don't know if it's true for you, but it's uh, again something that I've heard. Fee Only. Okay. Now the question is, Fee Only, I'm giving advice on what? So someone says, see, I have high net worth clients. I give them advice on EB-5 visas. Okay. All of us who have children abroad, we all know EB-5 investment is the most risky investment you can ever make, and it's a substantial, right? At that time, it was some $400,000, $500,000, $800,000. And it is locked up for some seven, eight years. Chances of getting it back are near zero. Now, you have a registered investment advisor 
giving advice on a product that is not regulated by SEBI, a highly risky product in which $500,000 is likely, most likely to vanish into thin air. After seven years, the investor will come to SEBI and say, he was registered with you. I thought he is, you are supervising everything he is doing. Now he has lost me $500,000. Now what are we supposed to say? Now, what are we supposed to say? So an advisor doing, giving advice on products that are not regulated by us and not regulated by any regulator. Okay, you happen to be doing insurance. We have said often that, you know, the regulators have been discussing that you are doing something which is a regulated activity. You follow their rules for that and our rules for that. But what about totally unregulated things like this? And then tomorrow that comes back on us. So what, tell me what I'll do with that scores complaint that your regulated entity made me lose $500,000 and he was a fraud. So, Ab uh, kya <laughs> Number one. Number two, I'll ask you. But he told me, this is what I'm saying, Nexus. Hmm. Yeah, he told me that, you know, the, uh, the other thing he has to give to his wife. Now, I gave him this and then the other stuff I... So, you know, it's not that straightforward. You sit in our chair. Absolutely. And you help us craft and you tell us how you will risk mitigate. We don't want to ban anything. You tell us how we'll re we will risk mitigate all this. We are open, willing. You all are the best brains in the country on this. We are happy to co-create with you. But ye sawal hum puchhenge, phir uska jawab aap hume dijega. So, uh, just one thing I really want to sort of appreciate. I think the world has changed. And I, and I, I would want to do a poll in the room, right? About how many people have income coming in only from the client? No, only from, regu from the no, client. No, one minute. From regulated products of the client. Uh, I, okay, I, one, one minute. Please uh, 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 lower your hand if you get any referral income from anybody else. No, lower, so no referral income? No. From anybody? No. No profit share from anybody? No. No um, other product income? No. Cross sell, upsell? No. I got them a property? No. Are ya. Ah, okay, Chalye. All those, all those who put up their hand, the proposal that we have on all your fees coming through the central mechanism, so you would have no challenge, no difficulty, and you will sign us a petition with your signature saying you have no challenge in implementation of that, and there will be no other income that will come to you or your associates. Sir. Uh... Manzoor? Yes. Chalye, very good. So, <laughs> Chalye, Jeevan, aapka kaam ho gaya. One petition signed. Sign. No, no, one minute. We have already signed. No, no, we have no, no, already no, no. sent, uh, ma'am. Jitne haath uthe the, kam se kam 50-60 haath uthe the. So, Jeevan, gin ke leke aana. Huh? Before everybody leaves, they have to sign saying we support and have absolutely no problem in coming through this and giving an undertaking that there is no other direct or indirect billing to the client. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, oh, wonderful. Can I... Are, can I... Ki to but can I... Can I... Can I... So, so it's so... It's so great. It's, it's so great that you have raised this. Okay. Uh, and... Uh, and I think... Uh, all... Uh, your colleagues are here and they are... Uh, privy to this fact that what we are saying is that the central fee collection mechanism that can work provided there is a widespread awareness about one, that there is such a profession as investment advisors, okay, two, that it's good you pay the fees or somebody else will pay the fees for you, third comes the method of paying. And I think that wide awareness campaign is a necessary precondition. In fact, in our uh, submission to the consultation paper, that's what we have pointed out, that this wide awareness campaign 
See, is Harsh, something I I have no disagreement with you the only difference that I'm guessing I'm not it's not that you've said it is that if you're thinking sebi is going to do a 500 crore television ipl kind of awareness program forget it see the baat hai we don't do it okay now what do we do i'm saying that through events through investor education programs and today you know that the whole art of communication has shifted okay did anyone need to do a 500 crore campaign to encourage people to use whatsapp kabhi aapne ad dekha earlier now of course there's a lot of the thing on encryption and privacy and all that jab shuru shuru mein aaya tha when you when you first adopted whatsapp was there any advertising you saw no so the question is today content rules you have the ability to make this speech you have the ability to go and talk in social media you have the ability you have a large number of supporters from the mutual fund industry who support you and you have the ability to do that but at a later stage when your association becomes very large and you have you have a million you know uh, members and so on and so forth maybe you can do a mutual fund sahi hai kind of a campaign which they do right they do out of their money so sebi cannot do that but there are enough and more means by which today what is sensible can be done and the word can be spread we issued one report that 90% of all investors in the fno market lose money did all of you see it did we need to do an ad for it no we didn't do any ad so i'm saying what is sensible and what makes what is relevant to a person it spreads like wildfire today uh let me live up to the aggressive tag that you gave me yes uh, i think the key is that uh, this is there is history the fact that people are not accustomed to paying fees it's changing as a lot of people in the room as i and a lot of other people in the room can certify that it is changing is changing for us we want it to change for a million advisors and i think that cannot be done without the blessings and the active support of But the regulator but not 500 crores bhaiya are you living in some wo dream na wo dream nahi hai nahi sawal hi nahi hamare paas hai hi nahi sir to ye aap bhul jaiye <laughs> you are not going to get even a penny out of us we don't do it so then we the, don't do it so then the issue will come back to the issue about the uh, centralized fee collection mechanism when there is a Hush, lack of i don't understand i don't understand your question okay because if you are saying that all of you are only collecting kosher money and you are going to tell your clients that from tomorrow please pay through this and this is your guarantee that you are you're dealing with somebody who's a registered entity and a kosher entity and you ask that person to tell five of his friends and they tell five of his friends and you know the maths you don't need a phd to to build that geometric progression okay you'll reach everybody you'll reach everybody so it's very simple if you have a proposal that makes sense and is relevant to people then it spreads like wildfire i told you our 90% loss making the whole of the country knows about it we never issued any ad uh, absolutely but the point again and we will close this after this uh, is the fact that i think this entire room knows this how many of the people who actually do the fno they know it have they, they it. although we are now forcing them they i believe they know it because every bro all the, the the qualified brokers which account for some 7 70% of all retail investors now they flash it every time you log in right and it says 9 out of 10 people lose money and people say yes see our job you're not a nanny state our job is to say please be careful aage khai hai ab aapko phir bhi kudna hai to aap kud lijiye हमारा काम है कि उधर खाइए सो दिस इज हाउ यू हैव टू वर्क इट 
okay? So you speak to, I don't know where you speak to, speak to your, uh, you know, uh, 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 your partners in the mutual fund industry, speak to the depositories, the cash statement goes, put it on that. Use your imagination. Every investor in the country gets that. Every investor in the country gets an SMS. Work with the ecosystem. You will reach directly everybody, no? Use again, your imagination, Harsha. <laughs> again, the issue is that uh, we are only 900 people and of them probably… No, you need only one savvy digital marketing person, get him on contract for two months to design your digital campaign, leveraging existing resources on a zero budget. He'll do it. Thank you. So, I think we've heard what we are required to do. Uh, moving on to some of the major pain points of mm -hmm. the good guys, as you say, and, uh, and these are real major pain points. I think uh, unless we find a way to sort of solve this, uh, the one million mark is really not going to be possible. Uh, so one is this compulsory three-year recertification, giving your exam all over again, okay? Uh, that is a huge business continuity risk and a lot of us in the room, because we gave it in 2020, a lot of us are due to give the exams and I, I don't mind admitting, I, I am fearful as well and uh, uh, I contributed to the syllabus, it's acknowledged in the syllabus. <laughs> I, I teach the PGP course in NISM and yet I do not mind acknowledging I am afraid. My point more seriously is this, that it is posing such a huge continuity risk uh, that it discourages people from even considering uh, the profession at all. Uh, that's what would one. you like? What would you like? What is your suggestion? Sorry? What is your suggestion? What would you like? So, I think as we have suggested uh, there is that if there is a certification, okay, then people can specialize. There is a continuing, pro every, med whether it is medicine, whether it is chartered accountancy, whether it is law, there is an ongoing professional education uh, that goes on. Uh, and, you know, there is compulsory, uh, you know, points that need to be uh, put there. Uh, and what that allows people to do is to specialize. Because, you know, investment advisory is large, right? There are lots of financial planners in the room today. There are lots of long-term buy and hold equity people. I don't think there are trading call providers in the room. but. Basically, it allows us, so we, people can specialize in uh, tax advisory, personal tax, uh, you know, relating to investments, people can specialize in… No, uh, I think what I meant to ask Harsh was that, let's say for instance, um, regulations change, markets change, um, how do we ensure that the person who is giving advice is current with the regulation and the developments in the market? That's our objective. See, we operate on first principles. And my teams know something, they will say, yeah, regulation. Why do we have it? Why do we have it? What, what purpose is it serving? All right? So, this, the purpose of this regulation is that you are advising somebody in money and life changes, regulations change, markets change, so many things change. So, how do we ensure that the person is up to date before he gives advice? That's our limited objective. Help us to address that. So, it could be, a, refresh, okay. it, it could be a refresher course, that, like the chartered accountants have a refresher course. Mm -hmm. But it is again specialized because the refresher course could be in taxes, it could be you in know, auditing so saying, standards. So no, 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 no. Again, th that's not addressing our need. I'm saying the regulation has changed over three years. How are we sure that the new person knows the… how do we know the old person knows, knows the new regulation? By doing the refresher courses, making him do the… him or her do the refresher courses. What does it mean, do the refresher course? Means not pass a test. 
you can have a certification exam if if required they okay. can but it should not be the whole course all over again because that i think is a no, it no. does not happen no, no, in any open. profession we, we are open wherever things change because as i said we will go to first principles please note ji our first principle thinking is you are dealing with other people no not dealing you are advising people on their money this is serious business you should be up to date on certain things i think we can all sit down and agree on what is it that's really dynamic what is it that doesn't change discounted cash flow does not change you don't need to ask me the question again agreed okay. regulation changes you need to ask me again sure agree on a list of saying this is dynamic this is static there is no need to test you on static stuff dynamic stuff needs once again a refresher and a and a certificate because some people say we learn but don't test us to wo to page down page down page down hota hai na usme to there no, is no, no such thing i completely so agree we are very open please send your recommendations and mr jeevan son parote will with full seriousness uh evaluate that and we will break it up what's dynamic what is static now that you are in the are so this i was asked to ask. that's all it takes to get talis so this ye is ye to badi simple si cheez ho gayi bhai so the tali was also because you know renu had specifically asked it's her birthday today and this was the birthday <laughs> gift that she had asked for <laughs> uh the other thing is the persons associated with investment advice uh the requirements for a person to sort of attract and this is a nascent profession mm -hmm. as of today we we flying we will fly but as of today we are nascent mm -hmm. and today for anybody to face a client he needs to be she needs to be a post graduate mm -hmm. needs to have 3 years of experience mm -hmm. needs to have passed 10a 10b mm -hmm. that you want what kya chahiye aap so i think the experience requirement and the post graduation requirement should be removed because anyways if you if he or she wants to become a ria at that time they will have to become a post graduate but how do we get a fresher in let that be a graduate let that have let a fresher come in ten it and be keep so that they are aware of all the you know requirements of the profession and so we are also able to afford this kind of people and 10a 10b then becomes a entry point to attract freshers in the profession next year will you ask me why do you need a graduate <laughs> will we ask her <laughs> by the way pucha gaya tha mere se <laughs> the problem is i've been around too long i have data for everything actually i was asked graduate ki kya zarurat what's wrong with because the original where was it somebody remind me the registrations that used to be done uh it was the the requirement was 10 standard pass or something ha huh? 10 10th ha huh? so i was told so see you you laugh this is reality and i there was huge resistance why do you want graduate we want graduate what is wrong with 10 <laughs> standard what is wrong with 10 standard pass and then you know sebi wants financial inclusion yes you want you want us to go to tier 4 tier 5 cities i don't get graduates over there what is wrong with 10 standard pass so just to be clear will you ask me next year 10 standard no. pass no 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 you want graduate yes we are on camera <laughs> so shall we clap no <laughs> no i think see uh, let me put it this way um the answer is a yes but why because our philosophy is allow something but with risk mitigation okay. so supposing we say okay chal okay you say you don't need to have a, a, you can have a graduate 
and let them pass the necessary exams and let them be associated. Now they are associated with you. Tomorrow, if they do anything wrong, your license, no, no, no. Again, I have data. See, you will shake your head. He was a rogue employee. How am I supposed to know? I didn't know. I sent him over there. He was on tour in some, you know, uh, uh, B30 town. How do I know what he's doing? I cannot record everything he says. He went and said these wrong things. He went and said assured return and all that. He was a rogue employee. I'm not responsible. So you tell me, <coughs> and we'll do a deal right now. The impact of wrongdoing of that person will be on you, meaning on the registered entity. You will not have the excuse of saying, one rogue employee did something, ab main kya karu? Folks. Deal? Deal. Very few hands I saw. Folks, come on. Deal, ma'am. Deal? Deal. Deal. Shall. So, some, somebody had promised me something if this happens. I want them to remember this. Okay? And now that, <laughs> now that she is in the mood, the third one. Kuch <laughs> <laughs> me. The, the fee no, no, charging. First of all, no, no, no. But yeah. on, a, on a more serious note, everything that I'm saying here, the deal is we promise to examine it. We promise to take it to our advisory committee. Absolutely. This is not a, a, this thing. We have to, this is a open, in, uh, the deal is we are open to it and we will examine it you are and considering go through it. You are considering <coughs> Actively it. consider. Absolutely. We will take to our advisory committee and all of that for active Absolutely. consideration. Absolutely. Uh, the, there are two more things. Okay. Uh, the other is on the fee charging mechanism. So today, we are allowed to charge either on a <coughs> fixed fee basis, maximum of 1.25 lakhs, or on an assets under advice basis, 2.5%. Uh, we are not allowed to mix and match. Now, the point is that definitely in financial planning and in other non-trading call provider uh, profession as well, uh, there is a need for doing both. There is a need for reasonable fee, that's a regulation. Our, our submission, our request is that we be allowed to charge on a hybrid basis See, our Not problem profit is, sharing, hybrid, no, no, I'll tell you. subject to no, it, higher of the two limits. No, we have seen this and this one is a no-go for the simple reason that you are now headed squarely to PMS. We've seen too much of it. This won't happen, sir. You say here, you are giving advice, you are giving PMS. You have to admit, if someone's running PMS, we cannot help you. Absolutely. So you are giving advice. What is your arrangement? The, and the reason that number has been put there, what is the limit? 1.25 for fixed and... And there's a reason why it is there. This is not a number out of a hat that somebody in SEBI woke up and said, Acha, kitna dialen. No. This is 2.5% was permitted to brokers and they give incidental advice. Let it be the same over here. And 2.5% of 50 lakhs, which is where PMS starts, is 1.25 lakhs. So... This, is, this was the logic, and if you have a client who is bigger than 50 lakhs, please go under PMS, discretionary, non-discretionary, you have the ability to do that. And please take whatever fees you want, performance, performance, everything. But this is the straight route to effectively doing PMS, which is currently illegal, and therefore we will not be able to consider that. So, I again actually go back to this segmented question. You know, and one of the things that is happening is that uh, a lot of people in this room actually don't do direct equity at all. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. We don't, and I, I think there are many people who don't do direct equity at all. Obviously, there are RIAs who do long-term buy and hold equity. The issue, and that is why this segmented and the need for separation, is that when we do financial planning, right, there is this need. We, we, there is no question of a PMS in financial planning in that sense. See, there Harsh, could be if you do direct equity. No, no, Harsh, we cannot build regulations 
for one specific niche business model. We are open to segmentation. We have not yet, unfortunately, reached a stage where we can do anything which is more. Maybe we will reach a stage. Maybe one day when uh, you, know, you come in and say, I want a regulation for me alone, and Sebi will say, this is you know, science fiction maybe, Sebi will say, okay, you and all your family members and all the companies or entities that you are associated with, uh, you give us the consent for monitoring through account aggregator, all your bank accounts, so that we know exactly what's coming in and out. No, no, one minute. And now we have the confidence that we can use technology to monitor what you're doing and what you're not doing. Now, if you are claiming, I'm only doing this, we will have a way to verify. Right now, we do not have access and we do not have the tools to verify your claim that I'm only doing this, now this is coming in the way. No. When you're getting this, when you, when, you, when you get a doctor's certificate, you get an MBBS, you can treat malaria also and you can treat something else also. So you say, no, no, but I only treat malaria. We don't have a mechanism for that. Maybe one day it will come. But this is not possible because we see it as a straight case of PMS. So, uh, would I take this that when the account aggregator framework becomes mm -hmm. far more powerful, mm -hmm. and Mayesh is sitting here, uh, that it becomes far more powerful and that uh, non-individual accounts can also be shared and mm -hmm. joint accounts can also be shared mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the regulator. Mm -hmm. We can have a hope mm -hmm. that this would be considered at that time. Because that day, hopefully, is not far, far away. Not far away? Oh, excellent. So, we will look at it at that time. But right now, we do not see it in the near term because okay. to us, this is a straight risk of illegal PMS. That's our first principles thinking. So, this is not happening in a hurry. Okay. Uh, and I should not make a forward contract beyond my term. <laughs> it, I think we can extract a commitment from Mahesh that it will happen literally in the next six months. Good. Uh, the last but not the least important one is this compulsory corporatization uh, limit at 150. Uh, about 67% of investment advisors are individuals. And individuals are the lifeblood of any profession. They are the ones who come in with the zeal and the entrepreneurial energy. They, they are the ones who will reach the nooks and corners, go through the entire strata, not, you know, not so deal I'll only with answer. elite. I'll give you an answer. Um, we have seen physically, with our own eyes, SEBI officers have seen um, one investment advisor with one registration, 500 people call center, full-fledged business running. I don't know how many people they drove to suicide. I don't know the answer to that. Okay? So I have a very simple question to ask you. Number one, if you have 500 people and that many clients, uh, corporatize karne mein aapko dikkat kya ho rahe? First question. Okay, itta bada business hai aapka. Karodo ka business chal raha hai. Aap corporatize kar lije. Achha. No, you are an individual. What, and, and all of you are claiming that no, we get only fees from advice and from giving good advice and hand-holding our clients and we have no other source of income, right? Related to the markets, etc. Very good. So this kind of client who pays you, let's say 1.25 lakhs, how often does he expect you to talk to him, meet him, guide him, show him data? How often he expects? So I think again, we come back let's to say, financial planning. No, no, no. If it is, there are people who just make financial plans. 
<laughs> How so, often a client uh, would expect he's paying you a lakh and a quarter per year? Hmm. How often does he expect to see your face? Uh, uh, Ma'am, what happens there is that they are not the one lakh twenty-five thousand clients. They are the fifteen twenty thousand clients who expect to get a financial plan done. So I'm again and again we come back. As you are talking of such, maybe you know, in your mind. It's like that. It's a very, very small microcosm of the set of people, and I will not believe it unless I see some data on that. Sure. So there's no point in discussing if you are telling me that there is a whole army of people of investment advisors who only do risk profiling and say asset allocation, and that they get paid a certain amount of money for that. I'm sorry, that's not our understanding of what the investor is asking for. That's not our understanding. So you're going to have to do a lot of regulator education to mm -hmm. convince us that that is actually a reality, okay? And we will go. We will go. You take us. We will go. If you tell us here are fifty thousand people, and these people, we only make a plan, give it to them, and come away. Okay. So then, what do we need to do? So this year, one hundred and fifty. Next year, another one hundred and fifty. One hundred and fifty is almost one every working day. 150. If you're only making plans, so you will do risk profiling, you will make a plan for that, you will do asset allocator. 150 is all just short of one per working day. So I'm presuming that you will do more than that. So let me... And we don't do anything else, we don't do hand-holding, so next year we don't need that customer. उसने एक बार आपको दस हजार रुपए दे दिए, आप घर चले गए, वो अपने घर चले गए, बात खत्म हो गई, अगले साल नया कस्टमर, वेरी गुड। सो आई थिंक इट ब्रिंग्स आल्सो टू द अदर क्वेश्चन अबाउट दिस लैक ऑफ डेटा, राइट? एंड आई थिंक दिस इज समथिंग वी हैव बीन रिक्वेस्टिंग दैट टुडे यू जस्ट data relating to how many advisors are there, mm -hmm. how many advisors are there is available, mm -hmm. how many clients we are serving, what is aggregate, we are talking aggregate. So here's our challenge, we would love it. See, we now thrive on data. You ask anybody in SEBI, the more data, the better. We take a circular and say, brother, if you give this reporting format, then it comes to trouble. Isn't it? Puri industry stand up and says over regulation, micromanagement, too many regulations, SEBI moving too fast. Aapi log bolte hai. To phir aap data denge, to aapko data milega na. Lekin jaha jis industry mein 30% of the people have not even come forward and registered with the first level regulation, a regulator after how many months? How many two years. months? Two years. Two years. What you want us to do? Uh, and hum jaise hi bolte ki aap ye data furnish kare, to there is a mutiny. And Sebi is told that you are being too uh, aggressive. So, show of hands and petition. How many of you would like to have a nice, robust format for furnishing of data? at a granular level so that it can then be aggregated and given back to the industry. Chali, show of hands. As long as it is Ek periodical. Minute. As Ek long minute. as it is periodic. Ah, periodic. Aap jo bole. Yes. Achha, chali. Uh, is there anyone who does not want to do this? Is there any RIA in this room who does not want to submit an annual information, annual or any period that uh, the regulator says? Is there anybody at all? There is the answer, ma'am. Excellent. So, can I have a petition? Absolutely. Sign, sign. They go, Absol just like sign, na. Absolutely. Na. Absolutely. Huh? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Absolutely. sign karke dije that the association wishes SEBI to bring a regulation or circular or whatever which requires the industry players to make periodic submissions of granular data so that the richness of data over time facilitates better policy making, decision making, etc. And we urge SEBI to do this. 
we'll be delighted. Okay? So, today, we have two signatures already here. Yeah, required. Everybody who raised their hands, you need to sign before you go. Uh, Shubhangi, 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 Shubhangi,
you should not allow the school teacher to give tuitions. Right? Because then there is a perverse incentive that school mein mat padha, tuition mein padha. So what have we said? We have said you are registered entities, you are non-registered entities. Mr. Registered Entities, please don't have any lena dena with the unregistered entities. Aapne dekh liya hamara consultation paper hai. Right? So we are also trying to understand this space and trying to respond to it in a way that recognizes that this is now a cottage industry. This is nukkar nukkar mein and it's going to proliferate with technology. So the responses that we have to have with it, for it is, has to be different, right? It cannot be rooted in history because life has changed. So now the question is what we are seized of this issue, we are working and you've seen the first step that we have taken. Also, I think a little unfair for you, Harsh, to on the one hand say 72% of the orders are against unregistered, but SEBI does nothing about unregistered. So I saw a little bit of a contradiction in that. So I know it's hurting, so you are being unfair to us because it's hurting, so I can understand. Um, but we have taken, we have imposed large penalties on some people. You have seen those. Those have become marquee cases. There are cases which are going on which are of fraud. So we can deal with fraud. We are empowered to deal. Our jurisdiction is that if you do something fraudulent, SEBI will do something about it. But at the end of the day, you cannot say that I want the tapa of being a government authorized school, but I want the freedom of a tuition teacher. So now somewhere there will have to be a framework where you have to choose. Aapko tuition class chalani hai, aap tuition class chalai hai, aapko school mein padhana hai, aap school mein padhai hai. You can't say it's unfair. Right? So we are happy to really, and because we are still dealing with this and it's still at, as I said, you've, you've seen two steps from us. You've seen us take some, issue some orders. You have seen us issue this consultation paper that registered entities. So there is this whole unregistered world. Registered entities should not deal with them. There also, there is a lot of, in the consultation process, naturally, we get perspective from all sides. We are taking that into account. We are contemplating some additional things, but this is actually the stage of co-creation. So whatever your suggestions are most welcome, but the suggestion cannot be that you give us the freedom of the tuition teacher, but we want the tappa of the school. बिल्कुल ये नहीं चाहते हम हमको अगर ट्यूशन टीचर बनना होता तो हम यहाँ बैठे ही नहीं होते वेरी क्लियरली वी सी अ ह्यूज वैल्यू इन द रेगुलेशन व्हाट वी आर आस्किंग इज दैट द होल थिंग शुड बी मेड अ लिटिल मोर इक्वल लिटिल मोर इक्वल that that's all that i think we see, are see what asking. does little more equal see that's I, what i'm saying i, I spoke about the Devil recertification <laughs> the hey wo baat ho chuki hai ja rahe udhar to ho ho gaya one thank you so much one thing i do really want to leave the thought with you uh, is that i think there is this general feeling that clients don't pay for advice <clears throat> I, I want to leave this thought with you rather strongly that that is changing. It is clearly changing and there are a lot of us, okay, who believe that that is the right way to provide advice. I, I think you would agree with them. There are a, a lot of us who do this. This is not just the people in this room. There were hundreds of people watching. See, as I said, we, will... we are small. <laughs> yes, we are a niche. So what I'm saying is that let's work on it. And as I said, that once this central payment thing is set up, and that comes along with an undertaking, that you are not directly or indirectly taking any other money through any other means. OK? So once that is implemented, I think there will be a little more credibility <coughs> in terms of our being able to uh, 
also answer to the investors that, you know, what is the control you have over it? People will say something. What is the monitoring mechanism? What is the, uh, where do you get your confidence from that that is happening, right? Today, when somebody asks us, when I, uh, you know, in every forum, let's say, for instance, I, I say that according to me, mutual funds are just the best way that any investor should enter the market. Okay, and that too, particularly through systematic investment plans. Why do I say that? Because we have solid data and we have the confidence in the industry that it is well governed, that there are risk mitigation things in place, that there is a furnishing of data. Of course, it's a smaller industry. It's, you know, 48 going on 50, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, here we are talking about a million. So the scale is different. But with technology, everything is possible. But, you know, unless Dekhye, jab tak neev strong nahi hogi na, uspe superstructure banane se fayda nahi hai, wo girega, kisi ko marega. So you have to strengthen the foundation, without that you cannot allow. So we have spent many years co-creating with the mutual fund industry. You don't know how much pain they have gone through. Mm -hmm. Over the last four or five years, the amount of work that that industry association has done in order to build a strong foundation on which now, and you know, we're talking about mutual fund light and all that thing, we want the industry to fly, Matlab, reduce regulation down to the minimum, just let them do, let them go out and create inclusion, let it grow tenfold. So, but you need a strong foundation. And that foundation, only you as an association can facilitate. You try and build a superstructure on the foundation you have today, you do not have a strong foundation. You have a very, very large uh, base of malpractices. That's exactly what we're trying to sort of uh, segregate uh, through Again. the segmentation <laughs> approach. We have uh, no dispute with that, but it has to be verifiable segregation. It, it cannot be that I self-certify that I only do planning. And then Absolutely. I have tie-ups with, you know, we've seen all of this, we've seen it a million times, Harsh. Right. Okay? We've seen it a million times. I don't give stock tips. I gave you that example. My wife does. I actually wouldn't mind if my wife gives stock tips. So there you go. So let's move on. Yes. Uh, so, I think I… Thank you so much. Uh, basically, I wanted to leave you with the thought that the number of professionals who now look at payment only from clients, not from any other side activity, is growing. Okay, so I do want you to have that thought. We will work to make sure that data comes uh, on that, uh, to you uh, on that. Uh, do we have time to take a question from somebody? Maybe. Two or three? Yeah. Somebody would like to ask a question? Media is not allowed to ask questions, oh, please. Achha. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, you know, um, the, um, the principles of natural justice, which very naturally have to be followed, which means that a full-fledged enforcement process has to be followed, which roughly takes between a year and a year and a half, and very senior people in SEBI uh, are required to pass orders of this kind. And therefore, to uh, revoke the registration of, let's say, 300 people, 300 enforcement actions will have to be undertaken by SEBI. Now, we are not complaining. I'm not complaining about it, OK? Because it is very essential that a regulator is held accountable and due process is followed, and that principles of natural justice are followed. I'm just trying to explain to you that right now we have Sebi Bhavan 1 and Sebi Bhavan 2. I often laugh, okay, 
that some of the things that happen in our market, it won't be long before we need SEBI Bhavan 3. So just imagine if 30% of 1 lakh people or 1 million people, as is my desire, do not comply. Even with a simple thing like this, it results in, it will, even today, result in 300 enforcement actions of SEBI. Can you imagine the load on the system? And then all of those will get appealed in SAT. So then it will go through SAT. So 300 cases in SAT. So in a democratic system, certain things have been put in place which are very important for a, as a democratic institution, but this is the implication of that. So it's not that easy, register revoke SAT appeal hoga, usme jayega. Okay, just one last question. Who is that? That person in the back? Yeah. Can somebody get a mic there, please? Just on this point of this 150 and all, uh, I, in my sorry, which point? Sorry, this point no, on the one. In my in my corporate career, I've come, I've dealt with a lot of corporates. I came across one organization which was a thousand crore turnover company, but was still running as a proprietorship. And otherwise, everyone really naturally transitions to a corporate to access bank loans and to limit their personal liability. But this group chose to remain a proprietorship. So the question is that. Um, how does corporatization, I mean, I would be, in fact, advised when I scale up my operations to corporatize, to limit my liability, but uh, a pers if I continue in my personal capacity, I'm exposing my entire uh, net worth. Yeah. So, why would the regulator really okay. insist? And just one quick point, uh, to get to that 10, uh, 1 million, uh, can uh, maybe SEBI work alongside RBI to maybe nudge banks, the banks, uh, to kind of actively take up RIA because they are like right there across every nook and corner of the country. And today, as we know, it's the approach is uh, uh, more like a distribution of products and sales based. And banks being the beacons of trust should really be encouraged to uh, come towards RIA. They only reserve it for the top echelons of their clients. Rest the entire spectrum is, yeah, thank you. So, uh, I think a uh, uh, very valid question that when we say that when you cross 150, you corporatize. So, what is the benefit, right? What is the underlying logic of saying you corporatize? Well, there are two things there. The first is that the mechanism, the, the investor protection that we expect when there is a corporate structure, a governance structure, a board, a compliance head, right? Uh, a certain minimum net worth. So there is the, let me put it this way, the seriousness and governance which comes with the corporate structure and everything that goes along. In our view, that lends a certain additional layer of investor protection as compared to somebody, a single person, uh, you know, having a point of view, um, you know, doing certain things, uh, operating in a certain, in a certain way. Um, the second question was what? Uh, banks. 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 So uh, most banks do something called wealth management, right? I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Now, they follow their own uh, uh, distribution, uh, they follow their own a economic model as to whether they think distribution is right or investment advisory is right. And that we had facilitated that you can do this at a client level. So. You are one institution, not all your clients are the same. Some clients prefer a distribution model, some clients prefer an advisory model. So, so long as at a client level you do that and at a group level you do that, we are comfortable with that. So, to my understanding, the entities are following their own methodology. Uh, and uh, my understanding is that actually there is an explicit RBI regulation which does not permit a bank to be an investment advisor. Is that right? Um, I think so. They have to take approval. Okay. Um, so I'm saying in, in any case, this is not something which 
as I said, from our side, there is full flexibility. At a client level, if there's any entity, they can say these are my advisory clients and these are my distribution clients. So we don't have any, we, we have put no restriction whatsoever. Thanks. So just one last question before yes. we end. I think one great thing that SEBI did with the regulations and not too many people are aware of this is what is called title protection. Under the investment advisor regulations, anybody else, unless they have a license from SEBI, they cannot call themselves as an advisor or a wealth manager or, uh, you know, similar sounding names. And this is something that the uh, NAPFA in the U.S. has put up as its advocacy target for 2023. They've been trying now for the last 10 years. This is something that SEBI gave us way back in 2020, and thank you very, very much, ma'am, for that. There's just one uh, follow-up on that, is that whilst the title protection exists, it's not being implemented. Uh, in fully. Again, there is a question of action against people who uh, sort of misuse uh, those. No, my understanding is, and we've given uh, open this thing, that please complain to Amphi, because it's mainly the MFDs who are doing this. And in fact, if I'm not mistaken, Navneet, we've even taken up that their association is still called Independent Financial Invi Advisors Association, and we have said that we have a problem with that itself. So we've advised them to change their name of the association also, because non non SEBI re regulated people also call Arre, themselves. Oh, we, we cannot solve uh, you know world hunger. <laughs> we can solve what is relevant to SEBI. Aap humse bataye. We are ready to address the issues we can address, but uh, beyond that, not our jurisdiction. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Very very much. I think today we've got answers from her. I think we need to give her a standing ovation. Thank you. Thank you really very, very much uh, for this. Ma'am, Just uh, I would request you minute. to please give us a few more minutes on stage. Uh, I would call upon uh, Mr. Tarun Birani for a vote of thanks. Uh, Tarun is the founder and CEO of TBNG Capital Advisors Private Limited with a 20 years experience in the industry and He's been a panelist in the industry uh, for many occasions. Over to you, Tarun. So, uh, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, I think uh, I have never seen uh, such heartening and such frank discussion with regulator happening at a forum like this. So, thank you very much. And I think uh, glad that uh, somebody is listening to us. And I think this communication will go a long way in building uh, larger trust between us. Yeah. So. Uh, I am a strong believer of manifestation, and I think you uh, started with 10 lakh good advisors. So uh, I, I give this affirmation that uh, that will happen soon for us, and uh, this will happen. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, yes, good advisors. The good advisors will get. So. Uh, I really like the way you have a very solution-oriented mindset, and you listen to us, and you approached every question with a lot of data analysis, and uh, that was very heartening and very positive, and I think all of us will go with a very different thought process after we leave this room today. So thank you very much for that, and uh, again, I would like to uh, mo uh, this, take this moment to give our heartful gratitude and appreciation uh, to the esteemed chairperson uh, uh, for gracing us her presence here. And uh, I, I remember five years back, we couldn't think about something like this uh, event with chairperson. And I think that was the power of manifestation which happened here. And it will happen in the next seven years also. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, ma'am. Huh? Yeah, and uh, I would uh, request Harsh to give a small token of uh, appreciation from our side. Thank you.
Thank you, ma'am. I request everyone to be seated till our chief guest leaves, please. We'll now be breaking for lunch and uh, do come back to attend a very powerful uh, pla panel discussion post lunch. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Extremely sorry for the delay in starting the proceedings of the second session. Uh, we are in fact privileged to have uh, Madam Madhubi Puri Butch in discussion with our Seb uh, Arya board. Hence, uh, this delay has happened. Uh, in the meantime, we can move on to the next segment, which is equally exciting. Uh, request all of you to please take your seats. Uh, I would like to call upon stage Mr. Prasad Ramni and uh, Mr. Bihari Lal Devra. So this is for the inauguration of the uh, white paper on risk profiling. Yeah, please. Yeah, please inaugurate and then I would request Prasad to say a few words. The white paper will be available for everyone to view on the ARIA website www.arya.org.in. Uh, may I request uh, Prasad to speak a few words, please? Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Um, I know that uh, this is a session after a pretty nice heavy lunch. So maybe uh, most of you are already still in a kind of a little bit of a in a sleepy state. If you want to go into full-on sleep mode, then you can read the white paper. Um, heavily, I mean, this is like, uh, this is the best version I could get my PhD team to write. Um, their original version was like difficult even for me. Um, the, the idea behind the white paper is to explore all the different things we were talking about this morning about risk profiling and what are some important characteristics and why should we do what we do. Uh, hopefully the idea is to actually um, get you guys involved in it. Uh, obviously if you have any input, if you want to like carry this discussion forward, you can always get in touch with us and we'd happy, you know, we'd be happy to engage with you and then see what we can do um, in the best way possible for, for risk profiling to elevate the practice of financial advice um, in this community as a whole. Uh, but thank you very much for being here today. Uh, hopefully, um, the panel discussion uh, will, will jolt you out of your semi-sleepy state and then we will get some uh, interesting uh, things going on. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Prasad. Uh, now that we have a risk profiling tool which has been inaugurated and a white paper on risk profiling. Let us have a discussion on using risk profiling to drive business growth because this is what eventually we are all looking for. For this, we have a distinguished panel with us today. Our panelists bring in a diverse range of experiences and perspectives that will add immense value to our understanding of risk today. We are honored to have them with us today. Please join me in welcoming on stage Mr. Kaizad Adjanya. Kaizad is the head of personal finance at Money Control. He will be moderating the panel discussion today. Kaizad is a seasoned professional with a wealth of experience in the world of finance journalism. He embarked on his career journey in the year 2000 at Outlook Money magazine. In 2008, he joined the founding team of personal finance at Mint newspaper, contributing significantly during his nine-year tenure there. His dedication to the industry led him to Money Control, where he has served as the personal finance editor for nearly five years. With 23 years of experience in tracking mutual funds, 
Kaizad has established himself as a prominent figure in the field. His passion for mutual funds and personal finance is evident in his writing and analysis. In his leisure time, he also enjoys sharing insights on tennis. Welcome, Kaizad. Uh, now I would like to uh, call upon Mr. Bihari Lal Devra. Uh, BD, as he's popularly known uh, within Arya, uh, serves as a director at Abacus Asset Managers LLP, an India-focused asset management company. His expertise spans a broad array of asset classes, and he has experience managing corporate, family office, and university clients. Uh, uh, BD is also deeply involved in the finance community and serves as a director on the board of CFA Society India and visiting faculty member for advanced finance programs. Welcome, BD. Uh, next, I would like to call upon Mr. Santosh Navlani, COO of ET Money. At ET Money, Santosh is responsible for the organization's growth, product strategy, design, and invest education. Prior to his role at ET Money, Santosh was SVP digital business at DSP BlackRock Mutual Fund. Earlier, he co-founded Money Insights, which helped Indians make informed decisions and was subsequently acquired by Times Internet. Being a key opinion leader in the fintech space, Santosh shares his insights on wealth management on the ET Money show that is broadcasted bi-weekly on the ET Now channel. Welcome, Santosh. Uh, I would now like to call upon Prasad Ramni. Uh, we have already uh, had his introduction earlier. Please welcome Prasad. Our fifth panelist, uh, Mr. Amit Kukreja, is not yet here. He's an individual uh, financial advisor based out of Gurugram. Okay, he's here. Great. Uh, so welcome, Amit. Uh, Amit is based out of Gurugram, and he's also a board member of Arya. Uh, now I'll hand over the stage to uh, Kaizad for the panel discussion. Uh, good afternoon, all of you, and uh, welcome to this panel discussion. We've almost reached the climax of the uh, of a very memorable uh, day that we have had over here. And you know, keeping in mind the underlying theme of this event, which is risk profiling, our panel is also on risk profiling. Um, as we all know, for registered investment advisors, for uh, fee-based advisors, uh, it's a given, and we all know that, that uh, you know, uh, risk profiling is compulsory. It's mandatory by SEBI. Um, you know, but I remember even before the SEBI guidelines came out in 2013, there were a lot of uh, certified financial planners, and uh, those planners who were oriented towards taking fees also used to do risk profiling. Now, you know, in those days, I mean, uh, many of us would remember risk profiling was done in a very raw form. You know, it was done in a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, you know, you jot down some notes, uh, ask a lot of questions, and then, you know, based on that, uh, uh, you know, the financial advisor used to suggest solutions, products, etc. Once the regulations came out, they became codified, you know, face-to-face uh, -face conversations became a little bit more uh, formalized, more codified, you know, one-pager, two-pager, three-pager, four-pager, and all of that. And, um, you know, cut to modern times, I mean, so much of work now has been done on risk profiling that now it's actually a business, it's actually a profession. There are people like Prasad who are here who devote their all full-time energies and, and, and um, you know, uh, it's a profession basically just to fine-tune risk profiling. That itself has become so big an industry, a profession. So, uh, you know, obviously, I mean, so much of data, so much of information being collected for, um, you know, through these uh, complex risk profiling, which today go by various names, right? I mean, today it's, uh, 20 years ago, it was just risk profiling. I mean, today it's um, quantitative analysis, qualitative analysis, you know, um, uh, you know your, your behavioral analysis, psychometric analysis and whatnot. So much of data these RIAs and planners collect, what are we going to do with this data? That's the question. So obviously, I mean, there's some, uh, you know, chatter, a growing chatter, uh, thankfully, within the advisory community as to how you are going to utilize this information better. Are you going to engage in more and more deeper, more profound conversations with the clients? Because you have so much of information now you're collecting, not just where the client is coming from, but also probably how the client might react to certain, you know, environments, like, you know, markets going down, markets going up, this and that and whatnot. So that's what we're trying to, you know, ask uh, our panel today as to, you know, with so much of information on hand, so much of data collection, how can they use this to enhance their business, to engage more meaningfully with their clients rather than just asking whether you like to take risk or whether you don't like to take risk, right? So, Prasad, let me start with you. 
um, you know, you've done obviously a lot of work in risk profiling and it's work in progress. Yeah. Um, you bring to India a lot of experience that, you know, uh, you've seen in developed countries. Just give us an overview of how risk profiling over there in US and Canada has evolved over the years. And um, second question I wanted to ask you right away is that, uh, you know, here of course, when, you know, when we deal with, I mean, when I deal with my readers and when planners deal with their uh, customers, you know, the focus so much is on returns. Right. You guys spend your lifetime explaining right. your clients the element right. of risk. Has the conversation in developed countries shifted from returns to risk or is it still um, a transitionary uh, period? Both your questions are fantastic questions and, and uh, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a backstory here um, so you understand where we actually came from, right? Um, Three, four years ago when we started Syntonic and we went out to the market in 2019, the interesting part was we never had risk analysis. We only had behavioral analysis. So the idea was to analyze a client behaviorally to kind of manage them better. And this was in 2019. We had more than about 300 financial advisors in the US use it, or even in Canada. Um, and finally what was happening was Almost like 80, 90 percent of them, they came back and said, this is fantastic what you've done with the whole behavioral profiling, but can you also do risk analysis? And to me, that was a very, very odd request because like with everybody, right, we had our own biases. We thought that, you know, risk analysis has been out there in the U.S. for at least 25 years, you know, uh, in, in a pretty significant way, like, you know, Finometrica, uh, Risk Allies, you know, all those companies, right? They're all basically born there. And despite that, despite that, literally 80% of the financial advisors we spoke to said that, can you also include risk profiling as part of your behavior analysis? That was a big eureka moment for me. And I was like, why? And then we basically, when we listened to them, we found that despite having all these very hardcore quantitative tools, there was still something missing. And this goes back to the evolution of uh, risk profiling in, in, in the US and Canada. To just give you another little bit of a tidbit of an information, there are a lot of big firms in, in, the, in the US which have thousands of advisors. You know, you have like big banks that have like between 12,000 to 16,000 financial advisors on their platform. And a lot of them actually have uh, pre-litigation risk departments which try to identify clients that are most likely to file a suit against their advisor, right? Almost always the issue was a misunderstanding of risk. So take these two things... Misunderstanding of risk. Yeah, uh, misunderstanding of risk, yeah. So if you take these two things together, on one side, despite having risk tools for 20, 25 years, financial advisors were asking for it. On the other side, you basically had large firms that were trying to pre-identify clients uh, who are likely to sue because of a misunderstanding of risk. So the funny part is, and that's when we started focusing on risk, and in 2020 is when we came up with a risk module and stuff like that, right? The reason I'm giving you this backstory is risk analysis has been, like rightly said, has been out there for the last 20, 25 years, right? So it should seem like this issue has been solved, but it's still not. Risk is still a very complicated topic. You know, risk means different things to different people, right? Uh, and that's what we have tried to solve using a behavioral perspective. But, uh, you know, these uh, risk profilers which are out there in, in developed markets, have they been successfully uh, capturing the investor's perception of risk over a period of time? Right. So, when you, when you talk about successful capturing, right, they are successful in capturing that point in time risk appetite. You know, for example, m you know, to a certain extent. And the other reason for that is, you know, while, uh, you know, financial advisors have been there in the US for a very, very long time, even they are not very different from our Indian ecosystem, where while they try to do the best they can, the focus almost always comes back to performance, and the focus almost always comes back to difficult conversations, especially when the performance is not good, especially when the markets are down, right? So the funny thing about diversification is when diversification works for you, you get a bad rap because the whole point of diversification is if one asset class is doing well, then some other asset class in your portfolio is not going to be doing well, right? That's what you want because the hope is the other way around will happen too. But people tend to focus on the one that's not <laughs> running, you know, that's performing well and say that, you know, why is this, you know, doing like this, right? So, 
in a sense, there's a little bit of an education required even for, um, for clients and advisors. And, and you need a, a psychological angle for that because these are things that cannot be purely captured by just your traditional risk assessments. I'll, I'll come to that point. It's an interesting point. Uh, but Amit, let me uh, come back to domestic shows and ask about you about your experiences. I mean, you specialize in, in, in um, couples um, right. in your financial planning practice. Right. And um, I'm sure you would have had clients who have stayed over with you for years. Yeah. Now, you know, what I really want to know and, uh, is any anecdotes or any uh, tales that you can share with us that during COVID, and we've really had a very hard hit during the three years, I mean, loss of income, loss of um, uh, jobs, um, loss of lives, so a lot of things happen in COVID. Um, and, you know, when you stick with a customer for so long, uh, any stories that you can share with us of your clients where you would have done a risk profile during those periods and you would have come to know about things that even you also maybe did not know of the clients where you know you could say that okay uh, you know uh, systematic risk profiling actually showed new light brought new light on the table for me as far as my clients are concerned yeah. any new light that uh, you're yeah, uh, yeah. Showed? so <clears throat> you know I, i'll slightly go beyond risk profiling while we have been talking about risk profiling there is a important feature in the tool called pair analysis. So during COVID, slightly before COVID and after COVID, when I was running this tool on a couple together, you know, I could see the change in their appetite for risk. I could see the change because there were couples where both of them had lost jobs. There were couples where either of them had lost jobs and there were couples where both of them, the wealth skyrocketed because they were both in the technology space. I could see the change in their perception of risk because they had more money in hand. They were willing to take more exposure to equity asset allocation because they had less horizon in hand, but they were um, risk takers they could not take. So basically COVID catalyzed all the possible situations where I could see the perception of risk changing in all the couples. And you know, the biggest pull for the couple to meet a financial advisor is because they have different money personalities. And when we do this risk profiling and we do these goal-based conversations, I see the alignment start to happen where the acceptance towards each other also goes up. There is also an acceptance toward what are you systemically, right? You know, as a system, these are the set of parameters that define your personality and these are the set of parameters that defines my personality. That awareness, that realization between the two individuals across the common set of param parameters is very empowering. It's very empowering for both of them and they walk away happy that, okay, we have a different perception about situation. We have a different or a similar perception about the circumstance. We have a different approach towards reaching the financial goals in the coming time frame. A lot of these factors become very interesting part of the conversations. And, you know, as Prasad was saying, risk is, it's variable, it'll vary given your life stage given the horizon that you have for the financial goal. It is never a constant. It's also a function of your life stage. You could be choosing to leave your job. You could be choosing to start a venture or you could be laid off, right? So a lot of factors come in picture and it keeps varying. So it's not a constant that you can just freeze the figure or a parameter. You need to keep working on that. You need to keep evaluating that. I might have not directly answered your question, but the points that I was trying to highlight is that there are many variables and risk can be a good representation of these variables with respect to how to manage the client's money. And if it's a set of two individuals, a married couple or a live-in relationship, then how are you managing so that the two of them are aligned with respect to money? That's, that's what I do. Challenges also in your case to sort of align the risk of uh, both uh, the partners in a marriage. Correct. But it's Correct. quite interesting you said that, you know, go, risk also changes so, uh, you know, sharply over the course of a financial, uh, uh, you know, financial life of a person. I mean, we've heard of goals changing, but you're saying right. even risks also can very drastically absolutely. change. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. A recent accident can cause you trauma. Hmm. A crash and a loss in the money immediately after COVID, where people panicked and sold, that led to trauma, financial trauma. But people who basically sailed the boat or people who hung in there, they made good money. So if they were nervous about the holding period, their, their confidence of 
keeping up the holdings became even more powerful because they saw the resilience in the markets. And people who panicked, they basically fell victim to a trauma. So both sides, the greed side, the fear, panic, and the good side also came into surface and people started either reinforcing their belief about risk tolerance or they started shifting their pattern of what is risk and what is, you know, risk acceptance. It's one of the parameters that he was talking about. How much you can tolerate and how long these are very important considerations when you do planning for integration. Santosh, I want to come to you, uh, you know, from a, a, a physical advisor to a digital advisor. And you obviously heard Prasad and, um, you know, Amit emphasize upon so much of conversation that happens in the way an advisor perceives the risk of an investor, of a client. Um, uh, you know, we can't ignore the supersonic rise of fintech players in India also, uh, because they reach the last mile. You guys offer the kind of connectivity that physical human advisors most of the times can't uh, uh, offer or they don't want to offer because it may not be so, uh, you know, monetarily viable. Um, but at the same time, when you are interacting with a client through a computer screen, uh, and, uh, you know, tell me how you guys imbibe the good qualities of a risk profile and still make it relevant for the investor or the client when you know that there is not going to be any sort of, um, uh, you know, physical interaction or talk or counseling to be happening. So how do you guys deal with that challenge? Sure, I'll try to uh, answer your question, but uh, uh, I, I would rather you know, give you uh, what we do and uh, maybe we are doing the right things with the, with the clients and uh, uh, we are somewhere making up for the lack of physical connect. So, uh, uh, eating money when it operates the business today, we actually have uh, multiple offerings for the end clients. There are people, uh, uh, investors who come in and invest on their own on DIY platform. And there are people uh, who actually have accumulated enough savings that they feel the need to now have a strategy or a plan in place before they start running their SIPs. So we get, kind of look at both these set of clients and see how the investment behaviors are different. So uh, when we do risk profiling, uh, we were looking at data recently and we were surprised with one aspect uh, that uh, despite this run up in the marketplace over last uh, three and a half years or so, uh, close to 80% of the investors uh, could have been better off by just replicating the investments they are doing on a monthly basis in a nifty index fund. Uh, and uh, mind you, most of these investors would actually have the top quartile funds in their portfolios because nobody, uh, uh, be it physically, be it digitally, uh, buys a two-star or three-star rated fund today. Everybody wants to buy a four or five-star uh, because there's no six-star yet. Right, so uh, people always want to buy the top of the rank fund, and despite uh, running their SIPs for good two years, uh, maybe three years, four years, they have not been able to beat Nifty in this bull market. Now, what does tell us that they actually end up taking excessive risk in their small amounts of money, and when the market panics, say for example in October 2021, and then again in uh, 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 Feb 2022, and goes on till July, again make a kind of, you know, make a one-way rally till October, again, hangs up there for some time, uh, only to start again in March this year and uh, has a one-way rally again. So these ups and downs actually make the DIY investors completely panic, as Amit was talking about. And uh, they, re they realize a need a plan. Now, one of the ways to provide a plan is actually helping them understand themselves. So what we do is, and we work with Syntonic for it, uh, we leverage uh, the uh, risk profiling in helping people understand what their uh, you know, standing is on risk spectrum. So whether they are somebody who can actually be uh, an all-in equity portfolio all the time, or they, can, they need a, a balanced approach towards investments. The moment they uh, uh, kind of you know, see the risk profiling, the, uh, the investment behaviors change, uh, because you're, now you know what you are. Uh, till the time you don't know what you are, you end up mimicking, uh, imitating your neighbor's portfolio, your colleague's portfolio, your brother's portfolio, and anybody who has made money in the market in that kind of people's portfolio. And you realize that that doesn't work for you. So when you risk profiling, it start, suddenly starts making sense to you that I'm not as aggressive as I was thinking. And you start to have a more balanced portfolio. So in a DIY platform, 85% uh, of the people's assets actually belong to equities asset class. Uh, 
about 10% uh, of the assets would be in like hybrid kind of funds, and 5% would be in debt. Uh, the moment I look at people who are uh, being advised by us, and the first step they do is risk profiling, uh, suddenly the shift changes. Uh, only about 60% people have long-term portfolios which have large amounts of equity exposure. 25% uh, people have mid-term portfolios which have large, large amount of debt. And about 15% will have only short-term portfolios which will have predominantly debt in the portfolio. So what happens is, once you start doing risk profiling, the, uh, the composition of portfolios change. Uh, because the uh, volatility starts to go down in the portfolio, you tend to give time to portfolios. Uh, or your investment uh, uh, in, in that sense. Once you start giving time to investments, magic happens because compounding ultimately is the biggest, uh, the biggest determinant of compounding is the time you spend in the market. So I think uh, the biggest advantage of risk profiling to us that we rely so far is it helps investors give time to their investments. And so far we've not found a better tool than risk profiling in helping people stay committed to their compounding goals. But how do you ensure that they stay committed to that? So what, what, what prevents them from selling? What prevents them from buying? I mean, how can tech players so, basically uh, enable uh, or disable sure. that? Sure. So what happens is on ED Money, when uh, 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 the investors finish this profiling, they actually are shown only advice portfolios uh, 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 which in the back end are asset allocation for themselves. And uh, uh, if unless they don't say that, for example, we are recommending that a long-term portfolio approach makes sense for you only when you hold the investments for seven years or longer. For somebody who may be risk score of say 80 plus, uh, or somebody may be in risk score of say 55 to 70, uh, he or she may be getting a long-term portfolio for 10 years plus. Uh, that person cannot invest uh, unless they actually provide a horizon for longer than that. Uh, or at least that much. So we basically bar people from investing in uh, investment strategies which are not suitable to them. Uh, so I think what we do is by restricting what investors can do in the app uh, and deliver advice rather than actually saying that we open up everything and let their intelligence drive the decision making. So I think uh, uh, restricting to what you are allowed to do uh, allows us to deliver advisory in a non-human fashion compared to a human fashion. So, Bihari Lal, um, this, um, you know, risk profiling, obviously, uh, you know, there's a lot of merit. Uh, we've heard about a lot of merits, um, you know, but when you are dealing with uh, individual advisors, um, uh, registered investment advisors, planners and all, uh, obviously, there is uh, the physical advisor. I'm not talking about the digital advisors, but the physical advisors, they uh, also, there is a lot of interaction element also over there. Uh, because of their business model, um, uh, is that the is risk profiling the only way? Uh, my question is to know the client better, or do the advisors have to put in an extra amount of work, or what more needs to be done to get uh, to the bottom of where the investor no, is coming excellent from? Excellent question. But so you have to take a step back and understand what the risk is. So risk, in my perspective, it's divided into four different quadrants. So on, on your top uh, left, you have things which you know that you know. So you know English and you know that you know English, right? So it's in your knowledge domain. Then things on the top right are things which you know that you don't know. Do you know how to fly a plane? You don't know how to fly a plane, but you can learn it, right? But they both are still in your knowledge domain and you can learn it, right? So do you know how to trade in derivatives? You don't, but you can learn it, right? Do you have spent time in market? No, you haven't spent time in market, but you can spend in time in market, right? On the lower bottom of the quadrant, on the right side, you have things which are uh, unknown to you right now, but you know how to react. So for example, uh, do you know how to react when an uh, earthquake comes? You know, in Japan, they teach you that you would sort of go down under your, you know, benches or maybe get down of the building otherwise, right? So you don't know when it will happen, but you know what to do when it will happen, yeah, right? The risk profile essentially measures these three quadrants which are in your knowledge domain or which you know how to react when this thing happens. But take an example of COVID. It's an unknown, unknown event. You don't know when it will come and you don't know when it, uh, what you will do at that point in time. So the unknown, unknown question is what risk profiling fails to capture or maybe you know, it tries to capture or you call it behavioral aspect of that. And that I think is, is uh, there, I think risk profiling acts more as a, uh, as a, as a question rather than a solution. Uh, and that should initiate conversations with client on what they're trying to do. In our whole life, you know, things move from unknown unknown to unknown known to known unknown to known known, right? And the risk profiling shifts. 
right so someone who has just started investing in the market or someone who just had a you know event or a trauma or a you know resilience of his portfolio in the market his his profiling was different before and and it will be different after and right but that that movement will shift and unless you as an advisor sort of start capturing that by talking to client you will never know right so i think risk profiling is more i mean it's less of a solution and more of a uh, you know question itself which allows that individual advisor or maybe in that case a digital advisor to decide what is right what is not right and what may be sort of you know going forward pathway for that particular client you know just to play the devil's advocate um, you know when we talk about risk profiling uh, we i don't i mean correct me if i'm wrong but we kind of assume at a level that investors don't know or investors are unaware or investors are at the beginning of the life cycle but um, if we aspire to go at a stage where uh, and of course there will be a lot of uh, financial illiteracy also among the investment community but let's say if an advisor has been uh, working with a set of clients and over a period of time you upgrade your clients uh, you know to a level where they understand where they become a lot more mature i'm just wondering does risk profiling become Some lesser uh, relevant for those kind of planners, just to play the devil's advocate. See, see, so there is a there is a fundamental challenge within the risk profiling. Now, risk profiling for each category of people in each age class who will have should have different questions, right? Now, because the regulator want wants it to be constant and consistent, you have same questions for all of them, right? And hence, we are not really worried about the validity and the sanctity of the question, but you are more worried about the outcome. Now, think of it this way. someone who is born in you know pre independence for him the most important you know or the most important invention of his life might be a atm machine right to withdraw money from anywhere out there someone who is born in let's say uh, 70s or 80s the mo- most important invention might be a cell phone right and someone who is born post 90s you know upi or some of these digital things might be the most important thing so if you ask someone who is born in 50s what's your preference in terms of investment he's going to say real estate he's going to say gold someone in 80s he might say you know i might want to put in something in a mutual fund otherwise someone who is now he is even ready to buy a crypto you know allow me i mean ask any investor who is in the age of 50 and 60 and tell him whether he can buy crypto he won't even understand crypto eh? how will he buy it right so the risk profiling no, i mean i'm not saying it's completely irrelevant irrelevant per se but i'm thinking it's a starting evolved. point markets also evolve conditions markets also markets are evolved yeah. so the risk profiling has to evolve right along with you know the changing conditions of the market so take another example you know so if if uh, uh, some of the questions which i think the risk profile typically you ask is okay can you guess the length of you know nile river or can you guess the number of mobile towers in mumbai well i am from a pre mobile era when landline used to be you know after a five year wait how do i guess what the number of tile towers are in mumbai right doesn't matter to me but that question to someone youngster is much much easier for him to answer he can multiply and you know give those those kind of answers so i think risk profiling evolves and no matter what risk profiling gives you that answer it's the advisor which has to interpret that with conditions and data other than risk profiling available to him and then sort of start educating that client for whatever allocation is trying to make prasad again i want to play the devil's advocate which yeah. i know we've spoken about the whole uh, morning about the virtues of risk profiling sure. but mm-hmm. since you've done so much of work on risk profiling and uh, since we're having so much of conversation around that does it take away uh, the importance of the presence of a financial planner or uh, i mean can risk profiling stand on its own or you still need Uh, a financial planner or so, an yeah. investment advisor if you just uh, <clears throat> take a step back right and then to just discuss what both santosh and and bd were talking about right just to kind of address a couple of things because both of them make you know really um, you know good points so if you look at the example of 50s and 80s and 2000 right there are behavioral tendencies that are context independent so what i mean is imagine that all these three people are overconfident the 50s guy will be overconfident in investing in real estate the 80s guy will be overconfident in investing in in equities like go crazy the 2000 will be overconfident in investing in cryptocurrencies so while the assets are different the behaviors are consistent you see so whether it's an american indian canadian whatever right there are certain base behavioral tendencies that define who we are as people okay the context changes now for example the same overconfidence in financial markets is making people take aggressive bets in health 
uh, overconfidence can result in you leading an unhealthy lifestyle and not taking care of yourself, you know, like me, for example. Um, in, in context of relationships, it can show up differently. But the point is there are underlying base tendencies, okay? Um, and to, to your question on this whole financial planner, digital versus human, and again to the point that uh, Santosh was making, right, like he is seeing a change in behavior of, of people, right? Why is that? Our entire industry has focused only on KYC, mainly. Know your client, know your client. But it is the responsibility of the client also to know about themselves. So we actually have a saying, KYC should meet CKY. Client, know yourself. You know, and, and so that is the reason why we come up with all this behavioral analysis to A, obviously inform the advisor on how to interact with their client, but more importantly, for the client to know something about themselves which they have not paid attention to before. That is the reason, uh, to be honest, I'm a huge fan of, of, of ET Money app because two main reasons. One, I know Santosh is one guy who genuinely wants to do the right thing for the end uh, investor. Uh, a lot of firms are not like that. They're like, can you sell, tell us how to sell more products? When Santosh spoke to me first, right from that day to this day, he always talks about doing the right thing for the end investor, right? So which is why I'm a huge fan. And the reason they've been so successful is because of this KYC meets CKY, okay? Now this comes to a point on, um, does this take away the need for a physical advisor or a, is a digital advisor? What we have seen in the US, in Canada, is our brains, right? It's, it's hardwired for certain emotions, especially emotions around money. So as you keep growing up, going up the ladder, right? You want somebody to kind of like talk to. See, for example, um, you might be willing to buy a book on, on, on Barnes & Noble or, or, sorry, not there now, in, on Amazon. But if you want to buy a BMW car, you don't want to do it online. You want to get the full experience, right? Same thing with financial landscape too. You will have a set of people who will, for whom digital platforms is probably the right way to go about. And then you will have a set of clients for whom a physical advisor is absolutely the right thing to do. Uh, the beauty of, at least like the beauty of India as I say it is, it's such a nascent market, such a huge market at its infancy, that there is a tremendous amount of space for everybody. That, does that kind of like... Yeah, that, that's fair enough. That's because especially if you all also keep internal checks and balances to ensure that even in the absence of advice, there are some things that you cannot do because your risk does not allow you to do. I mean, I think that's fair enough, right? So, Amit, uh, one of the last questions I wanted to ask you, I think we're just running out of time. Um, you know, First is that, of course, we, we, we were talking, we listened uh, to a speech by uh, Ms. Madhbi Puri Buch, and, you know, there was, there's an aspiration to reach a certain level of uh, investment advisors, uh, you know, in the next yeah. few years, because the number of advisors are so, uh, is a very small number now. Um, but, you know, the importance of risk profiling, my question to you is that, uh, is it, is it like, is it, is it more important for somebody who's starting out because you know you don't have so much of an insight in your customer, or is it that it is as important for an experienced advisor who has been with uh, clients for about 10, 12 years or so? So, how should you investment advisors at different levels of their journey approach uh, the seriousness of uh, risk profiling? I, I think what pays off in this engagement with the client is knowing your client as much as you can with respect to his money behavior, money mindset, and his goal fulfillment plan. If you want to have a better grip on this engagement, you need to stay on top of how this client is likely to respond, behave in the given circumstances, as long as we are hand-holding the client to his financial goals. For you to have a better relationship, you, ne you need to know the person better, and you need a set of tools to know that person better. And this is one of those tools which will help you integrate and knit the relationship together. So for me, irrespective of whether I have X years of experience, I'm starting afresh, or I have already earned two decades of experience, for me, a set of tools and processes which help me know better my evolving client 
who is evolving with circumstances, who is evolving with his own life stage, who is also growing older. Those set of tools are very valuable to me. So I would continue to subscribe to those tools which are helping me create a deeper engagement for my clients. The age of the of practice doesn't really much matter. I mean, it's, it's, it's evolving. It's evolving, yeah. Okay. yeah. It's evolving for us, it's evolving for the client, it's evolving for the entire ecosystem, ecosystem. also. So this tool, the set of tools and processes will continue to play a pivotal role in strengthening that relationship. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for a nice discussion. And uh, I think we've completely run out of time, so we come to an end of this uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay, Thank you, guys. We have a round of applause. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, guys. I request you all to please continue be on, to be on stage. Uh, it was indeed a very invigorating uh, discussion, and I'm sure our attendees have a lot to take back. Uh, now, as a token of appreciation, uh, we would like to present a memento to our panelists. I would uh, invite on stage Mr. Jay Thakkar. Mr. Abhijit Talukdar. Kavita Menon. Mr. Nitin Savant. And Ms. Trupti Murlidhar. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, I would uh, take this opportunity to again remind you of the special discount being in, offered by Syntonic for the registrations today for the new tool. And also to thank our uh, partners, our Platinum Partners, DSP Mutual Fund, HDFC Mutual Fund, Quantum Mutual Fund, and SBI Mutual Fund. Our Gold Partners, Access Mutual Fund, HSBC Mutual Fund, S&P Dow Jones Indices, White Oak Mutual Fund, our silver partners, Mire Asset Mutual Fund and Tata Mutual Fund. If you would like to share your insights, please use the hashtag ARIA IAC, ARIA Investment Advisory Conference. Thank you very much. And to conclude this engaging event, I would like to call upon stage Mr. Tarun Birani for the vote of thanks. And thank you for joining us today. So. Thank you very much. Uh, I know I will not bore you guys with a uh, lot of uh, speech, but uh, I want to start with uh, a month back. I still remember when we were conceptualizing this event. Harsh was Harsh and Vishal were the one who were like uh, very, very focused, passionate, and uh, they wanted to make sure that this event goes uh, in exactly the way you are seeing right now. So first of all, a uh, huge round of applause for both of them. I think uh, not possible be, uh, without uh, their uh, support. Apart from that, uh, again, I stand here uh, today with the immense gratitude uh, in my heart that we bring to the close of this uh, Financial Planning and Investment Advisory Road Ahead Conference today. Uh, this uh, event has been a great success according to me. I think we have seen something which has never been witnessed in the ARIA's history. So let's give a round of applause to something like this. Uh, again, we had a privilege to hear Madam Chairperson of SEBI engaging in thought-provoking discussion and, uh, and I think uh, most of our questions, queries, everything, uh, I don't know whether positively or negatively, but uh, we got answers to it, right? So I think that is definitely a great start. Uh, again, uh, as we reflect to the valuable insights uh, we gained in this and connections made, I encourage each one of you to carry forward this spirit of collaboration and learning uh, that this conference has given all to us, all of us. 
Uh, again, I want to conclude with uh, a quote uh, from Warren Buffet, the best investment one can make is on yourself. And I think that is where we should focus ourselves on, on developing ourselves and uh, getting better each day. So thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your attendance. Thank you. Yes. Again, I want to thank all the organizing uh, AMP team, as well as uh, Brand Aesthetics, all the teams who have collaborated and helped us in making this event a, a huge success. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Again, Syntonics also, I think this is also, thank you very much. Yeah.